we talk is money, honey. All we talk is money. All we talk is money. It's like bees to the honey. The sauce cast, baby. All right, clap it up, everybody in the house. Thank you, Jorge. On the look at that, we have an amazing audience. Clap, look at that live audience. Welcome, everybody, to the sauce cast. My name is Adam Sosnick, and today we have a very special, special show today. You know, we typically talk finance and romance, but overarching is culture. And you know, as Breitbart said, politics is downstream from culture. And we have one of the smartest savviest, sanest political commentators in the world with us today. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Dave Rubin in the house. All right. Thank you, Dave, for that being here. That doesn't say much to call me one of the sanest. No, it's I mean, a these days, short list, you know, man. common sense ain't common these days, as they say. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. If you were just watching the PBD podcast, which ended an hour or so ago, Dave was on there having a great conversation with PBD, myself, Tom, Vinny, the whole team. But now we got him here on the Sawscast yes. with the ladies. First time. In the house. For the first time. Ooh. First time. First time Dave Rubin. First time. Here on the not first time on this set. Because you were here with Judy, Giuliani. You oh, were yeah. here with PBD multiple times. But this is your first time here with the, the ladies of the Sawscast. Mm -hmm. So we have a special crew with us today. Amy is in the house. Amy Dangerfield, conservative leaning Aussie woman. Right? Hey, Natalia hey. Devaya, you know her, you love her, you want her, you got her. Huh? <laughs> she, I don't know where you stand politically. You're kind of... She's just valuetainment. Center. Okay, we know that. But these, this is sort of our home team here. Then we have Pixie, who's back. Hi. Pixie, progressive internet personality. You brought a friend with you. Aaron's in the house. Progressives, who... Uh, progressive Victory, I believe, is your... Yeah, company you work nice. with where you match streamers and influencers with politicians yep scary stuff out there and to, to, <laughs> to keep you guys aligned we have laura padrino out here oh. hardcore cuban mama conservative best cuban food in all of miami she wanted me to make sure i give a shout out to the vaca fritas and the uh <laughs> and the uh the one now? The lechones asado. The lechones asado. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tu sabe. Everybody knows about this in Miami. And um, we're going to have a great conversation with the great Dave Rubin. And we also got Humberto here. Humberto, Malik has the day off. He's on vacation. But Humberto, just so you know, he's very nice. He seems very likable guy. One of the more extreme dudes I've ever met in my life. But he Extremely said, nice, Adam. oh, Extremely my God, nice. Dave Rubin's Jesus. coming on. I have to be a part well, of it's this. It's all his fault. I used to be a TYT fan, and now I'm here. Oh, What's wow. going on? Yes. Oh, fault. so you uh, you woke up. Yeah, I woke up. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Now we're on this team, yeah. you know? Now, okay. okay. Humberto might steal the show today, guys. Anyway, Jeez. Malik will be back it next week. It wouldn't be a week. bad thing. Humberto's hilarious. Right. So, um, guys, today we're going we're gonna to get right into it. We're going to be talking politics. We're going to be talking culture. We're going to be talking domestic issues, immigration. We're talking foreign issues. We're even going to talk a little relationship stuff out there. You're a father of two I at am. this point. Anyone, anyone else on the panel have kids other than Padrino? Oh, we're going to have a conversation about that. No kid. Andrew Schultz claims that I had kids. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that. can't prove it. Oh. Can't prove it. That's can't right. It. So anyway, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, it's your first time being part of the Sauzcast because you're a fan of Dave Rubin. Thank you for being here. If you're a long time listener to the Sauzcast, welcome back, baby. This Thanks. is what we do here on Valuetainment. So I want to start with Dave Rubin. I'm going to get right into it you know they say because uh, i'm i'm kind of in following the dave rubin camp Sup i used to be more of liberal now is more of a disaffected liberal now some of the things i'm saying these days people are thinking is like saw's like full-on maga right wing now no my life's I work is complete with you basically thank yeah. you you're like the experiment that i was working on that i didn't even thank know you. i was working on frankenstein <laughs> it all the happened. jewish version out here but thanks. dave moved from california you're, you're from New York originally, yeah. moved yeah. to California, did your show. Um, now you're, a, as of what, two years now? Has it been official? Two years? Got here on December 17th, 21. Uh, officially a Florida man, okay? And Florida gets a lot of uh, bad reps, you know, bad names out there in the world, but everyone seems to be coming to Florida. But what I appreciate about Dave is his mantra, his slogan is, it's a crazy world and he's got sane views. And that's where we're going to start with Dave. Today, you know, they say famously, um, if you're young and you're not a liberal, you have no heart. Yep. 
But when you're older and you're not a conservative, you have no brain. brain. So for our brainiacs over here that are uh, completely in the progressive camp, uh, just so they know, uh, the evolution from you going from a liberal to a conservative, you were more of a libertarian, you said you voted uh, for Gary Johnson, then you went to the Trump camp, now then you joined sort of the, hey, let's get Florida Governor DeSantis on board here. Now you're aligned, obviously, more with Trump since DeSantis has dropped out. We covered that on PBD Podcast. Check that out. So famously, you had that conversation with Larry Elder where you saw in real time, you're like, holy shit, what is what? Everything I thought I knew, Larry Elder, who's been on the show before, super smart guy, kind of broke it down for you. So as a liberal who has transformed into this just mass appeal, conservative, sane guy, our progressives over here, What's the future hold for them if they keep the same ideology? And what's the future hold if they wake up and become a little more sane like Dave Rubin? Oh, well, I mean, if you keep the progressive ideology and the woke ideology, I mean, it, it, it leads to endless misery, childless, familyless, uh, probably broke, endless misery. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm not really a conservative in, in like the truest sense of conservative. I would say I'm a classical liberal, which is hard to explain from an American context at this point because the word has just been so mucked up, but I believe in individual rights. Everyone should be treated exactly the same under the law. I believe in laissez-faire economics. The government shouldn't do that much. I believe, I believe in basic law and order, and I believe in borders, things like that. All of those things sort of make you sound like a conservative now, but for the way America operated for 200 plus years, those were those were liberal values. Mm -hmm. if, if we were in England during the Enlightenment in 1700, those were liberal values. Um, but progressivism basically, well, I guess we'll see what happens over the course of the next two hours, but progressives generally are, there's the thin, very thin veneer of tolerance. They talk about tolerance a lot and they talk about decency a lot. And, uh, and they make everything sort of sound nice, but under that very thin veneer, you usually will find somebody that really wants to control the world that's often quite nasty and racist, actually. Mm. And, uh, and those are the things that are quite anti-liberal. So it's a, it's a shame, unfortunately, that the progressives have hijacked liberalism. Interesting, yeah. so the progressives... Thus leaving a guy like me and you uh, to be hanging out with conservatives, being like, oh, I guess we have a lot of common cause with these I guys. I would say that the most important uh, voices out there tend to be more conservative-leaning people. I challenge you to find voices on the left who are kind of making sense these days. But that's why I want to bring the ladies into the equation here. He just said, you know, they're kind of kooky, they're kind of nuts. They're trying to, you said, uh, take over the world. What was the word you said exactly? Well, I believe the world is what it is, and you can figure out a way to work within that to make a good life for yourself. Progressives generally have an, an authoritarian view of the world. Like you can make the world bow to your views. Mm -hmm. You can make the world, communism sort of, or socialism or Marxism, they always end up killing an awful lot of people. They don't do it in the name of uh, controlling people. They do it in the name of tolerance and diversity and everyone should be equal and equity and all of these things. And what they end up realizing is, oh, if you want everyone to be equal, you're gonna have to kill an awful lot of people to get there because human nature means that we're different. We have different starting points. We finish in different places. We have different skills. Some people are born rich and lose it all. Some people are born poor and gain it all. Um, there's, that's all what the gestalt of life is all about. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think progressives, it's, it's just not a well thought out ideology. It's, it's really, how do you feel about something? And, oh, you feel that way? Let's see if you can make everyone else feel that way. And if you look at the scoreboard, you know, whether you go to uh, Mao's China, you go to Stalin's Russia. Gotta kill a lot of people. They killed a lot more people than even uh, Adolf Hitler did in Nazism in, in Germany. So you're hearing all this. You know, Dave's saying that you, Pixie, you're trying to take over the world right here. You're trying to indoctrinate everybody into your political <laughs> thought. You know, you hear the words woke and you hear DEI and you hear ESG and you hear these globalist type things. How do you respond to some of the accusations that Dave Rubin well, has like said about your Well, I'd like to know a little people. bit about yeah. what you think of the world. Like, how do you do, what do you think progressivism means, I suppose? Yeah, um, I guess when I'm talking about like, progressivism or wanting to live in a more progressive society, what I usually use as a model for is a lot of countries in Europe, Finland, Sweden, um, Very white France, countries. Germany. I mean, there are countries that basically have instituted a variety of social programs to help 
um, their lower classes basically get a fair education and a fair start of life. I think um, there's a lot of inequality in the world and I'm not saying that all of it is like unwarranted, but I think that when it especially comes to children, I don't think there should be any child that goes hungry. I don't think there's any child that should have a poor education. I think every child should have an opportunity to grow and thrive and that we shouldn't basically be screwed over because of decisions that our parents made that we didn't get to choose to do. So that's where I start from, from this idea that like skills are developed and we can help people develop those skills and be able to come to their own versus, oh no, you know, this is just life, leave it that way, whatever. So that's where I stand when it comes to How do to you things. feel about capitalism in general? Um, I don't think capitalism is like inherently evil, like how some people claim it is. Um, I think that it's not suited for every single industry. I think that sometimes when there's a for-profit motive, um, it can actually make the industry worse when it comes to what they're trying to achieve. So for example, having private prisons, for-profit prisons. Well, what does that incentivize? It incentivizes lobbyists to try to get um, more harsh laws passed that aren't equitable to the crime actually committed so that more people end up in prison because they make a profit out of people being in prison. So it's not every single industry having a for-profit motive is bad, but there's certain ones that we should be like, whoa, wait a second, are you actually getting in the way of a good society because of your for-profit motive? And then I'm going to let Dave respond to, obviously, what Aaron has to say. Where do you draw the line between classic liberal, an American liberal, a progressive, a leftist, or just a full-on communist, Marxist, collectivist? Where do you stand on this line? Where do you think this line is sort of being blurred in society today? It's for both you guys. I personally think labels like that tend to not be so enlightening because they end up being like Rorschach tests. People hear progressive, conservative, centrist, and I think people don't like to align, them, like, align themselves with labels like that because they don't really tell you anything about what people's politics are. I like to go issue by issue and ask people on a case by case basis, like what are your thoughts on this policy? What are your thoughts on this social change, this economic um, idea? So as and a progressive advocate, what are your top three policies that you would love to implement if you were president? I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm like of an old school type left. I you know, would like to see kind of like the FDR is like the New Deal realized. Um, and also like a hybrid of what Pixie was saying over here. I feel like Americans, this is a, an amazing country. We have a lot of innovation, a lot of young people that are very ambitious and there are very, there, there are economic barriers holding them back. And if we could have like Medicare for all, um, free college, free state college for people um, and a higher minimum wage, that would enable people to actually realize their full potential. Right. So, so yeah, go ahead, well, I would say, uh, I mean, none of those things are true, right? Like you can, can you have everybody get free college? Well, nothing's free. So what you really are doing, you're taking money from some people to give other people a state college. And if we've learned anything in the last, I don't know, five years, like the state is probably the worst mm -hmm. executor of education that you could possibly imagine. If you want to indoctrinate a generation, which generally is what progressives want to do, then sending them to state college would be good. Uh, Medicare for all, like of course everyone wants everybody to have health care. This is where they have this very thin veneer, the ideas, it all kind of sounds right. But then we know, I mean even post Obamacare, we know that most doctors, I have several friends who are doctors who were uh, fairly successful doctors before Obamacare, and now they mostly are pencil pushers and paper pushers and everything else and do more involving real estate than actually tracking uh, and you know, prescribing medications for patients. Uh, so the idea of could the government give everybody, could the government give everybody free education? Sure, the idea is nice. Does it mean the education is good? No, actually we know that for a fact. Could the government give everybody healthcare? Well, the idea is nice. Could it actually, and, and what was the third one? Uh, minimum Medicare. wage. Oh, and minimum wage. I mean, this is basic economics. Like, the idea that the government should set a basic minimum wage for anybody. I mean, they can tell you that at McDonald's, okay, you should make $15 an hour, and then congratulations, you go to McDonald's, and now they're all iPads. And soon enough, the, the guys flipping the burgers will be robots. So these things, again, they all sort of sound nice, and I'm sympathetic to people that are in their early 20s that got fairly poor educations, probably from state schools, that then think these are the right ideas, but none of these things operate in real life. Like you hiring for, for this show or jobs that you do, you hire people based on 
you want to make a profit and somebody wants to get a gig and like, will they work hard and then we'll see what that's worth. Skills pay the, the bills. But not the government coming in and mm -hmm. being like, yeah, you better pay it. Why? I mean, $20 minimum wage. Why not? In Cali, they had uh, the rep who was like, well, why not a $50 million? $100,000 minimum I mean, salary? Come on, yeah. Man, yeah. Barbara yeah. Lee, I believe was yeah. her name, was running for yeah, Senate. Yeah. She didn't win, by the way. Minimum wage. She didn't win? Yeah. Oh, that's good. And we had this conversation last yeah. time that I used to be like, of course, minimum wages. People need to be able to work. They need to be able to have. have Make a living. I remember when he, uh, one of my buddies is like a union guy. He's the fight for 15 took over Florida. But then it becomes a slippery slope. And we learned that at the end of the day, the higher the minimum wage goes, who's going to end up paying for it? It's the consumer. Right. Well, so are any of these things, like the conversations that you guys have, and then I want to get Laura involved. Does anything ever change your mind? Or are you anchored to this is my opinion? I'm sticking with it. I'm just going to figure out a way to clap back rather than being like you know what this dave rubin kind of guy kind of makes actually some sense like what have you changed your position on um i'm open to having my mind changed the problem is that usually when people give a rebuttal like what you just said about the minimum wage um then it comes back to well like you know economics 102 teaches us about like the inelasticity and elasticity of a good so basically if you're going to say oh no the cost goes back to a consumer well it depends on how elastic a good is so if it comes to something like toilet paper like for example people have to buy toilet paper that's a good that doesn't really you know change that much people will continuously buy it the price range basically stays like more fixed in a way like if somebody charges like two dollars per toilet paper roll well people are still going to go buy it but if it's something that's more luxurious, like let's say fast food or something more um, not necess necessary. Luxurious fast food. I love that. When yeah. I say that, I mean in that. Somebody's been in and out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I mean that, I basically am trying to say that like it's not a, yeah, non-essential, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, well, then the price range has a lot more elasticity. It can change more. People are like, oh, well, I don't really have to buy this hamburger meal, whatever. I can just, you know actually cook some food instead, for example. Or you can just eat bugs. That's what they want. <laughs> yeah. So there it is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Umberto. Check your text. So the point is that when it comes to this whole idea of like, oh, minimum wage increasing automatically makes like everything like more expensive. Well, it depends on how elastic a good is. But back to the original point, I am open to changing my mind. I always like to have like in-depth arguments and I really think my stuff out through. So it's not that I'm not like, I don't think I'm infallible. It's just like I look to have more conversations so that my mind could hopefully be changed in certain areas. Yeah, I have to say that's great to hear. You hear that so rarely from yeah. a progressive these days. I would also say like a simple way to kind of game this through would be to op open a business of some kind, whatever you're interested in, like open a pizza shop and then kind of look at the books. I got to pay this much for dough. I got to hire somebody behind the counter and somebody to clean up. And then suddenly start thinking, well, should the government be telling me how mm -hmm. much I should be paying this person? Or mm -hmm. I'm selling this amount of pizza. I'm buying this amount of material. I got to pay my rent, blah, blah, blah. And then very quickly you will learn that the government should have nothing to do with that. I mean, I've started several businesses. And the more that you do, you realize, oh, the government is already taking my money in a, a whole series of ways from property taxes to payroll taxes and everything else they're already regulating you in ways that you cannot imagine that in terms of opening a business or even if you wanted to become a hairstylist getting a license or whatever else it might be and then if you actually do that then very quickly uh, you'll also realize that the burger joint that's selling the luxurious burger versus the other one the more <laughs> of those places that exist you'll have more competition mm -hmm. and ultimately that will drive prices down and actually quantity up because people want to eat things that taste good and also you know, you go to a, an In-N-Out and it's like, think about how different the experience at In-N-Out is than, say, McDonald's. I haven't been to a McDonald's in like 10 years, so maybe something's changed. That's why you're so skinny but, these but days. Yeah, in the yeah, shape yeah, they yeah, exactly. Shout out to you, buddy. To, I haven't been to In-N-Out in a while either. But the point is, when you go to In-N-Out, you can tell that the corporate structure there is right. The employees are happy. They're paid mm -hmm. well. They're taken care of. But it's not because the government forced In-N-Out to do it. They figured out a system. They were like, we're going to make damn good burgers. You're going to get served pretty quickly. It's going to be clean in here. People will want to come in. They'll start telling their friends about it. The operation will start working. And then you'll see their business go up. Their employees <laughs> are happy. The people that they serve are happy and then what happens the other joints the mcdonald's the burger king does that even exist anymore these other places that don't do it as well that for all the reasons that i just explained they start disappearing so competition and that has nothing to do with the government competition is the thing that ultimately evens everything out and if you ever walk into a chick-fil-a yeah those are the i happiest. mean that I, those i i've 
candidly not a fried chicken guy. I wasn't a big Chick-fil-A guy. People, you know, we'd take it, you know, take out whatever. But I went into a Chick-fil-A for the first time in a Chick-fil-A recently. And I, yeah, it was like right here in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. The experience, hi, welcome to Chick-fil-A. Yes, my pleasure. And it, can I get the door for you? I'm like, <laughs> I'm about to get punked right here. But yeah. it, it, it was the culture. And you know, that, that's someone, like, I think they're closed on Sundays. Yeah. They've had a lot of backlash like that because they're anchored to actual American beliefs, service, community, religion. Christian chicken. There you go, <laughs> right there. Uh, I want to get Laura's opinion on, and not that you guys are like ad, you know, advocating communism, Marxism, or something like that, but your family's from Cuba. Yeah. And there's been a lot of flare-ups in Cuba recently. I mean, there's, all, there's always happening right now. And you're from Australia. You're starting to see some of the cracks in the Australian that. system. Go to Laura first but I, sure. I, I want to go to you first about, yep. about what you've learned being a Cuban-American and why so many Cubans or Venezuelans or people that have fled communist countries are like, no, I'm not playing that game. And that's <laughs> not for me. Not for me. I remember I was with an Uber one time and the Uber driver, he's like, listen to his song. He has Americans. I was like, I was like, Fidel, good. He's like, hey, what? what are you talking about? You know? I was like, communism, good. And he's like, what? What are you saying? I was like, yes, Fidel, communism. And finally, he like pulls over. He's like, hey, my friend, I don't like this. There's no for me. Like, impassioned. What is it about communism, socialism, that Cubans, specifically South Americans, have learned about that ideology? Well, it's very obvious. I mean, obviously, they destroyed their country. They had to come over here. They saw something incredible, and they don't want that to happen again here but i have to say what you were saying about the when you're young you're lib then you learn a little bit you become older and then you become conservative yep. that's what i feel is going on so you're talking about like will they change their minds 100 percent to your point what you're saying is basically live a little i think that means like have a business employ some people then you're not going to be saying all this about you know, these crazy minimum wage. You would, you would not. It would just be impossible. So it's, to your point, like when you've experienced these kind of things, that's when you change your mind because you've, you've lived a little bit. Every single government agency to all these things, I'm reiterating what you said, but from healthcare to education is done so much more poorly with the government than it does it is done privately that that is what becomes so obvious when you become a little bit older when you're younger and i get that it it sounds naive to us because it's just so obvious because again we, we're a little bit older we've experienced things but it's it's sweet i understand the heart behind it it just doesn't make any sense but to the the, the point about the cubans i mean again you saw it happen. It destroyed your country. You're a successful person. It's all been burned to the ground. You come here to have something wonderful, and you see it happening again. I think I mentioned this once, but my grandmother said straight up, and this was a few years ago. It was around, um, like, pandemic 2020 time when everything started to really ratchet up. She's like, I'm watching the playbook mm -hmm. happen step by step what happened to Cuba. Your so grandma said My grandmother abuela. said that. Shout so, out to Abuela right so now. She saw what did she it, say the playbook that she saw in the 50s, 60s versus today? Exactly. What she saw happen in Cuba was playing out here. She's like, as if it was a book, step by step, every single thing that was happening here Give me some examples. What, what are those things? I mean, when it was a lot of stuff with censorship, it was a lot of, there was, I mean, obviously in 2020, there was like a lot of riots and stuff. Imagine they were shutting down businesses. Mm -hmm. all of the things that we all experienced during 2020 that to us it was it was really extreme but we just it was kind of like this drop in the bucket which some of us were protesting right where some mm -hmm. of us were saying hey let me work hey i'm not going to close down all this and some of us were pushing back but some were just like the government told me to so i'm going to and obviously that's that's frightening to some people because it starts seen it with free speech yeah and yeah, then, then they such censoring. a good point about uh when you start a business your perspective will change because all of a sudden the government's involved and hold on, I got a payroll tax, and then I got this, I got, what's his Medicare thing? I got a, the formal, now there's mm -hmm. regulation here, and then if you're not starting a business, I challenge, none of you guys have kids, I don't have kids right now too, but I mean, I've, I'm a little bit older than you guys. Once you have kids, and your concern is no longer about yourself, and it's about others, I assume that also makes you sort of shift your mindset. 100%. Well, of course, and also you realize when you start making money, you start realizing, boy, if I keep more of my money, it's not yeah. that people then just hoard that money right. forever and do nothing with it. Yeah. That would be within your right. And yeah. obviously some people do that, but most people, when they get more money, and I know plenty of rich people, they spend a ton of money. They Spend create, or give, well, or give or donate. All yeah. these things that you want when, with a kind heart. 
we're able to do that. And even if it's not with, even if it's purely for yourself, sure, so Ber Bernie sure. always goes after, you know, a million, well, he used to go after billionaires or right. millionaires, then it became billionaires and 1%, except 1%, you're in the 1% if you make 400 grand a year, which actually is not a tremendous amount of money in the world that we live mm -hmm. in. But they, they always go after people with yachts and it's like, you know how many people you have to employ to build a yacht, to take care of a yacht, right. that are gonna work at the shipyard and everything else, so you've thus created all of these other jobs. You could be, you could be a billionaire and have the most ridiculously large house that clearly you don't need to survive, but you're hiring tons of housekeepers and you're hiring tons of staff and people that, and security and all of these other things. Uh, so I would try a, maybe a good uh, thought game would be Bernie Sanders. I assume you think he's pretty good guy or like In general. pretty good, right? I'm like what, give me something that he's ever accomplished. What do you mean? He was like one of the first, um, I don't know if he was a senator at this point, but basically like one of the, I think like representative senators, whatever, um, fighting for civil rights um, when he was like in his like early 20s, there's like videos of him or like pictures of him basically advocating for that. And I think to have that foresight and being willing to like stand up for like civil justice and inequality and then go on to have a career in politics, like with that foresight, I think that's, that's something important. So, so he hasn't done anything since the 60s? <laughs> no, I think um, since then he's brought into like national attention, conversations about like $15 minimum wage, the ideas of like Medicare for all, he made it mainstream, same thing with um, the idea of public, um, free public tuition, college. I think being able to bring those to like the forefront of Americans' minds and being able to actually have a conversation leads us to the direction that I personally think is better for right. society. Right, so I think, I'm not trying to be a dick here, I think we sort of debunk several of those things, but if, you, if the argument is that 50 years ago, he was on the front lines of marching for equality when there actually were laws that mm -hmm. were, that black people couldn't do this or that, or Jim Crow laws or something like that, well, as a liberal, you should be for equality under the law, so of course that's just. But I would say in the 50 years, basically, that he's been a senator, there's a reason you can't think of anything he's accomplished. I can think of something. He's it's accomplished nothing other than he did become a millionaire and he owns three houses, mm -hmm. but he's never passed a piece of legislation with his name on it. I think maybe one about 30 years ago, something about sanitation in New Hampshire. Um, but he actually has done something very dangerous in America, which is teach people that envy and that greed and that wanting what other people have so you can do what you want with it is good. And that, I think, is deeply dangerous. But I would love to hear what else he's done. What else has Bernie done? What has he accomplished? Something that's important to look at when you look at a politician's record isn't just what they voted for, but what they voted against. And Bernie Sanders voted against the Iraq war. And I think his entire approach to American foreign policy not being quite so hawkish or being interventionist is something that I, as a young person, like personally. And yeah, you know, Bernie Sanders is a millionaire, but that's not an issue to me. I don't have any, um, I don't have any issue with people having like personal prosperity or wealth like that. And he made the majority of that money off royalties from his book *Our Revolution*. So I just see that as him profiting off of his innovation and creativity. I don't see that ironic as is what it is being how. Well, he certainly he is, doesn't need three houses. He could no, definitely lend out some of no, those but he's rooms anti to some of the and illegals. That's what made him yeah. wealthy. Yeah. Well, she does, you got to give her credit, credit due. If, if he did, in fact, vote against the Iraq war, I would assume we all agree that was a shit show of all shit shows, especially Afghanistan. But, yep. okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's on Bush. But one thing about Bernie, remember when he was on Bill Maher, and you've been on Bill Maher before, multiple on the yeah. real time and also on the Club Random. Oh, this clip when, you're going to reference is one of my favorite is moments this in television. the equality versus yeah. the equity one? Yeah, it's one of the most incredible Ruben, please things. explain this, because it stumped him, and I go, I, I guess. It really, uh, you it, equality, equi I, I can guess. Can we, is there equality. a way we can play it? Is there uh, a way if we, we can, can, our, if we our can friend grab that, maybe I'll try to do it in like 30 but seconds. But the whole DEI perspective about diversity, equity, inclusion, I would say that he's the OG, the the, right. the grand wizard of the of the squad, of the of the AOCs and the Presleys and the Rashida Tlaibs. Right, but the beauty is the revolution yeah. eats, eats its own, so he will be eaten. You can feel he's not even that relevant anymore. No. He will be eaten by it. Showed up to the... Uh, but there uh, was a beautiful in moment. In a mask. This was what, about six months ago, he's yeah. on Real Time with Bill Maher, and Bill Maher asks him, Bill Maher, who's a liberal, a true liberal, yeah. uh, and always has been, asks him the difference between equity and equality. Right. So before I explain any further, would either maybe either one of you want to explain what the difference is? Because that's the, the basic idea of, of progressivism. Go ahead, Aaron. The difference between equality and equity. 
I would say equality, people typically associate with like homogeneity, everything being the same for the most part. When you use words like homogeneity, nobody knows what that is. Do you mean like is. equality oh, of outcome? Yes. Like the outcome That's is no. the same? It's something like what Dave was saying, like equality under the law is something that I think every American is entitled to as per the Constitution. Equity is, is actually kind of like a Marxist idea, right? But from each according to one's ability to each according to one's need, where you address inequality by specifically tailoring it to each individual person's need, rather than trying to have like blanket approaches that might have some people falling through the cracks or elevating people more than they actually needed to be. So I think that's kind of the difference between equity and equality. It's yeah, where you start to where you that end. better than Bernie did because Bernie didn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Bernie literally said, I don't know when Bill said, what's the difference between equality and equity? And it actually should have ended Bernie's, I would say, largely fraudulent career right there because he's pushed the ideas, the Marxist yes. ideas of equity on America that we should take from some and give to others so that we all end up in the same place. Which again, you have to kill an awful lot of people and take from all of the creators uh, so that we all end up in the same place. And by the way, they never actually end up in the same place uh, because there's always a communist class that lives at the top that's gonna eat all their foie gras while everybody else eats bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bernie did not know how to answer it and Bill desperately mm -hmm. tried not to own him uh, in mm -hmm. that moment, but he basically did, and yeah. and it should have that should have been one of the moments where people are like, wow, this guy is just a fraud. You know, there was also a moment where uh, Ibram Kendi, you know, who wrote uh, which one is it, a ra a racist baby, anti racist baby, anti racist baby, it's racist baby actually, but um, he where he thought that his son for a few days, his like six year old son was coming home thinking that maybe he was a girl. And he's on camera saying how horrible that was. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you were Mr. Equity and you're Mr. Trans Rights. Mm -hmm. So every time push comes to shove with these people, they fold very quickly, sort of like a wet paper bag. And, and that's Bernie not knowing the literal definition, basically, of communism versus capitalism or, the, or Mr. Woke being upset when his son suddenly is going to be his And daughter. if you even look at the sanctuary city analogy, it's like, We've seen Texas and the border states crying out loud for years. This, this is insane. Millions and millions of people. But once a couple buses show Ooh. up at Martha's Vineyard yeah. mm -hmm. or a couple hundred thousand people, God forbid, tens of thousands of people show up in New York City, Eric Adams, we can't take this anymore. So it's like the wall thing, right? Build a wall, walls are racist. We all fell for that in 2016. All of a sudden, Nancy Pelosi, you got a wall around your house, baby girl. Like, what's going on here? You've got gunned uh, uh, protectors, security around you, but you're, you're against guns. So it's like, what's the famous phrase? It's like, um, not not for me, Rules but for, for thee. What's the yeah. whole situation? Yeah. Uh, do you have that clip of Bernie oh, Sanders? Yeah, uh, obviously. Can we play it? Yep. Okay, this is Bernie Sanders, who's been pushing for DEI, uh, not knowing the difference between equality and equity. And it's not the same word in confusing equality of opportunity with trying to guarantee equity and outcomes. Okay, that's interesting because I think this word equity has come into the language in the last few years. And before that, we didn't hear it a lot. And I think a lot of people hear equity and they hear equality. That like it's the same word. And it's not the same word in the same concept. So how would you differentiate between equity and equality? Well, equality, we talk about, uh, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Come to think of it, you know, uh, equality is equality of opportunity. All right? We live in a society, we want all people right. to have whatever color your skin is. Equity, I think, is more guarantee of outcome, is it not? I yeah, think, I think so. Yeah, I'll take, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, for thanks, Bill. Thanks. 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 I don't know what I'm doing here. What about uh, equality? Equality. Uh, yeah. Okay. So everything he's been pushing with like, DEI is actually They should have taken him equality. out back and shot him yeah. right after that. Like, what an what absolutely fraudulent life you've lived. You don't know the basics about what you have. He has thrust this nonsense on America. And when asked the most basic thing, like the most basic thing, what's the difference between air and water, he does not know. And Bill is trying not to embarrass him there. Well, when it comes to equality and equity, you know, I don't need to Google this, I don't research. We're supposed to be living in a colorblind society, MLK... The famous speech, I have a dream, oh, all our children and can be in a, live in a society where it doesn't matter about the color of your skin or the content of your character is what it's all about. But equity, it's, and the DEI, it's all about the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, what group you fit in, your identity mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of backwards. You were going to say something, Amy, about equity and equality. Uh, not necessarily uh, about that. I mean, I guess I could touch on that a little bit. Uh, hearing what 
Laura had to say about Cuba. It's absolutely devastating to see what's happening there right now. They've shut off electricity and all of these are a lot more uh, obvious to the average person, right? But there are plenty of countries out there. My country, where I'm from, one of them, Australia, where you wouldn't necessarily call it like socialist or communist, but we have like a socialized health system, for example. We have systems in place that are not for profit specifically, even though the country, generally speaking, operates under capitalism. Um, sure, there are some really great things about that. Trust me, being here without insurance in the States, I would rather go to a doctor in Australia. Mm -hmm. I felt the brunt of that. However, what I can tell you is that when you add up all of these little things together and then you throw a situation like COVID out there to the Australian people, that's when you realize how disenfranchised and disempowered these people are. And all of these sneaky little policies and all of these things that have been snuck in under the guise of equity or equality or whatever the heck it is that you want to call it is now the reason that Australia is going to be one of the first countries to follow in the steps of a social credit system such as China. Mm. Right now, they're already moving towards a cashless society. And all of this has been extremely contrived. And I completely agree with you guys. Like, I, I have a heart for people. I have a heart for organizations. I give to charity. However, when you structure your governmental system around that, there are going to be people with ill intentions who are sitting at the very top, again, not the ones eating the bugs, the ones eating the steak dinners, who are telling people to eat bugs, who are actually pushing a very deep, dark agenda underneath all of that. And I'm telling you guys, look at Australia in five years and the the evidence for that will be very apparent. And it's terrifying to me. Well, it's why the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions uh, is true, yeah. right? Like, I don't this think- why we bring on a smart guy uh, like Dave Particularly when I, well, but when I've quotes. heard you talk and I can see sort of the energy that you're talking with, like your intentions obviously are good. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's been so dangerous over the last couple of years is that progressives have become so largely hysterical, which you're not but have become so largely hysterical and called so many people racists and bigots and homophobes and transphobes and they're yelling and they're silencing people and everybody else that it that the, whoever has the good intentions on that side have been completely drowned out. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're going to be a future leader of a progressive world, it may not be exactly the world that I want to live in, but I think you'd be a far, it seems to me, in the few minutes that we spent together, you'd be a far better mm -hmm. uh, arbiter of that than the people that are the leaders now, say AOC and Rashida and the rest of these mm -hmm people that I would call really sort of anti-American maniacs at this point. Your response, Aaron? I would say that our friends Laura and Amy here are the perfect, perfect example of what I was talking about earlier, how our political labels don't exactly define or capture the nuances of what we personally believe. Like when Amy started talking about healthcare, when she compared the American healthcare system to the Australian healthcare system, which is much more socialized and has easier access and low costs, if not any cost, because there's no cost at the point of service, mm -hmm. she was saying, I miss it so much, especially as somebody who doesn't have private insurance. Because like Pixie was talking about earlier, healthcare is an inelastic good. If you are having a heart attack and you need emergency medical services, you will pay anything and get into any amount of medical debt in order to have that issue resolved. So private insurance is a perfect example of a market failure because private insurance companies are motivated not, uh, not by healthcare outcomes, but by profit, by money. And now she's here in America and private insurance companies are very expensive. And how is that any different than, a, that effectively amounts to a private tax, right? Like what, what do you no matter think how state, young and healthy you, think you are, state healthcare no matter how young and healthy are you are, you will by. have to see a doctor again at some point. And so, young people usually don't get health insurance because they think, oh, I'm never going to get sick. I'm not going to need it. But at some point you will. And I don't think people should be having to get into like crippling medical debt just to contend with basic health issues and keep up to date with their, with staying healthy. I agree. But like, did you not realize the point of what I was saying? Like the right. point of what I was saying is even though these things are good in general, like, yeah, trust me, I would rather have not spent several thousand dollars when I had an ear infection recently over the course of like a three week period. However, I would much rather operate under the system that America has here but we have a constitution where our freedoms are protected than be in Australia. In fact, right now, I'm literally trying to create a plan to get my closest friends and family out of Australia because I'm so terrified of the direction that it's heading. And a lot of the reasons why people claim Australia to be such a good place is because of the policies that we're talking about here. That individually could be a good thing. However, the intentions that are behind it and the agenda that is pushed out behind a lot of these things 
is negative. And that, for me, outweighs any positives that could ever come from these more socialized systems. You know, well, there, would you, would there's you say that America... Issue. Well, there's another issue. When you socialize all these things, you put us all together in something. And we shouldn't all actually be together in something. Because first off, you have a constant system of jealousy because some are providing, right? Some are creating and some are taking. So now you're going to have, you know, sort of a class warfare version of it. But think about it sort of simply like this. So if you have socialized health care, now, first off, there's there's always going to be private health care, too, because the rich people and the people that can afford it are going to still get the best yes. care, and they're going to figure out other ways to pay for it. And basically, every good doctor will figure out how to get out of the system. So you will have a system with lesser care in general. But then, let's say we're all in this system together, or basically the bulk of us are in this system together. Well, if you're young and healthy and you eat right and you exercise and all of those things and then your neighbor is fat and eats fast food all the time and never exercises and has diabetes and a bunch of other comorbidities and everything else should you pay less or more than they pay but and you can see how over time it will create all of these resentments between people because oh i do everything right and then what you end up doing is what we largely do in america which is you punish all of the good people mm -hmm. oh you take care of yourself well you still have to pay in as much as the person mm -hmm. who doesn't even though they're a drain on the system and you're not a drain on the system oh you have a good job and you pay more into the system and you don't use the system well that guy doesn't really have a good job and doesn't really do anything and plays video games and watches porn all day but he's going to get more of the bulk of the benefits of the system. So the more we centralize the ability, we, the more we centralize the system that we're all part of, the more we actually have working against each other rather than figuring out what works for you, your family, et cetera. I want to just get into the money side of things, by the way. Uh, you know, you're saying, uh, people might be saying, well, she's in Australia. Where the hell is it down under? That's a billion miles away. <laughs> if you hear what the people of Canada are saying, Okay, because Australia and Canada are pretty so similar, right? So they're country. So a lot of these things that are rolling out that are happening in China, like the, yeah. Australia is one of the test beds because it's just this little island in the middle of nowhere. But a lot of the other Commonwealth countries too, Canada has already implemented a lot of very restrictive, mm -hmm. terrifying, like borderline commie legislation that's already occurring right now. In fact, Jordan Peterson... Yeah. from Canada was just flown out for the committee hearing. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Where they were talking about the Patriot Act and all of these um, intrusive legislation that they're trying to implement here. They brought him in as a case study for what could happen in Canada. And yeah, the same thing's happening in Australia. Yeah, right great now point. Too. I mean, we do, obviously here on Valuetainment, we own the app called Manect, where you can connect with people, business leaders, influencers, thought leaders, celebrities, and ask them questions. I can't tell you how many people from Canada hit me up because they know we're in Miami and South Florida and they're like, bro, I don't know if you know anybody, but I'm trying to get out of Canada. <laughs> what, who do you know? I'm like, yeah. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not your guy. But we've had Jordan Peterson on the podcast. He's a very good friend of yours. Gad Sad's been on before. He broke down how he wrote the book, The Parasitic Mind, yeah. right? And how the taxes were ridiculous, what they're, what they're trying to do. And essentially the conversation that we're having is should business owners and just individuals uh, be able to manage their money better or should the government? Now, the evidence is out there. If you're the government, you just add another trillion, two trillion, three trillion onto the debt. We're at, what, $34 trillion right now. Meanwhile, if you're a corporation and you, yeah. you take on this much debt, boom, you're bankrupt, you're out of business. But the government can keep taxing. When you hear tax the rich and AOC wears her shirt, tax the rich, everything that's going on there. And then you hear things like, well, billionaires shouldn't exist. It's like, okay, pretty sure the billionaires are the people that are building the businesses. And the reason that became billionaires is because they had equity in a company, not the equity that we were talking about before, actual equity, stock options, stocks in a ma massive company. And the market's like, dude, we like this Apple product. We like this Tesla product. Shit, everything I buy is from Amazon and they become billionaires like that versus the government just wants to tax and tax and tax and tax. What have you learned going from just like a normal comedian, New York, to actually becoming a multimillionaire when it comes to taxes? I mean, you learn that it's your money and you should be able to do what you want with that it. That sounds it's like a J.G. Wentworth commercial, yeah. but it's your money. <laughs> yeah, J.G. Wentworth, Wentworth, eight, seven, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's what you learn and you learn it pretty quickly. You know, I, I'm friendly with Peter Thiel and he, I, if I'm not mistaken, someone could fact check me on the numbers. I think he wrote the first check for uh, Facebook, which was 250 grand. Wow. It ultimately turned into billions and billions of dollars, Correct. which then he invested in creative ways that protected him from taxes. But then he went on to create 
uh, it could be several hundred other companies or invest in several other hundred companies. Not all of them succeed, right? So he loses money on some and others become massive things. Uh, but again, before when I mentioned the thing about, you know, whether they have yachts or planes or whatever it might be, you end up staffing, you, you build a life that you have some control over. And it doesn't matter whether, whether you are worth $100,000, which I know is a lot to a lot, a lot of people, or whether you're worth a billion dollars, it's yours. And the idea that the government should just come in and rejigger society however they want. Mm -hmm. uh, but really the point that you just made about that the government can just print money. Nobody could operate a, a business. You couldn't operate your own life like this. Like if you have a $5,000 credit limit and you blow it, the government isn't just like, all right, here's another 5,000 mm -hmm. and another 5,000 and let's kick the can down their own five, five years. So there are just basic responsibility things that the government, because the government has all the weapons basically, is allowed to get away with. And I would say that the best, here, let's put it this way. I just moved here from California. California, where I was paying another, I think, 13%. 13%. I was, How's that 13% work? I was in the, highest, was in exactly. the highest tax bracket. That's how many so, more employees? So 13, yeah. yeah. And I pay my guys really well. Yeah. And and I take care of them. Beautiful people, and I, look at that. By the way, I pay all their health insurance, yeah. and I buy them lunch every, every day, and I'm giving them dinner tonight. But those are all things that I do. And it's not because I'm just so benevolent. It's mm -hmm. also because it benefits me to have happy employees mm -hmm. that feel that they're valued, and then they'll work harder and see more opportunity for all of those things. I, I like to think I'm nice and benevolent. That's nice, but it's not purely that, right? It's like if you keep people around you that are happy and feel good about what they're doing, they will do better. It's why nobody wants to work for the government. Even Bernie Sanders is one of the few people he works for the government because he's figured out ways to become a millionaire doing it. But the average pencil pusher that's at the uh, at the DMV. drive DMV or literally any go to any government agency everywhere. Why do they? They don't have a pen. They have to wrap their pen in in plastic <laughs> and a rope. Hope because nothing works. Nobody wants to work there. Nobody wakes up. I'm going to work for the government today and it's going to be good. It wasn't that way, by the way. 50 years ago when, when NASA was trying to get us to the moon, we had the greatest scientists working for the government. The greatest scientists want to work for Elon Musk. Exactly. They so want to go every, to everything they want to go has, origin. Yeah. But anyway, last point, the 13% that I was paying in Cali, I don't know where the hell it went. Florida, we have better roads. We have better policing. We have better infrastructure. We have quite literally better everything. But everyone in Cali was just like, I'll pay that 13% because I live in Cali. But what it becomes is just a giant slush fund to keep the people that are in power in power. Yeah, and then you always see... How do we have roads? How do we have schools in Florida? It's interesting. No state tax. How's, uh, it, how's but, it happening? And you never see people from Florida or from Texas fleeing to California. <laughs> right. It's always people fleeing Illinois, yeah. California, New York... Billions of dollars, like, yeah, I'm out of here. I'm going to manage my money myself. I don't want Gavin Newsom doing this. Mm -hmm. I don't want the government doing this. Which leads me to my next conversation about just general politics Americana, right? So people say, oh, Trump, he's a businessman. He's going he's gonna to bring a business-savvy mind, real estate. And, all right, Biden, he's a career politician. That's what's going on. So um, here's just a couple of headlines that I want to get your guys' perspective on what's going on in the news right now. So um, the judge in Georgia, um, under the uh, election interference case, has now dismissed six indictment charges against Trump. I think it was 91, now it's down to 85. Uh, meanwhile, you have people like John Stewart and uh, Representative Jamie Raskin basically saying they're using the buzzwords for Trump, autocrat, the end of democracy, the dictator thing. Um, and then you have someone like Bill Maher on the Biden side of things basically saying, listen, Biden, you need to drop Kamala Harris and bring in another woman of color, Nikki Haley, to basically be your campaign. So I want to have this conversation with you guys on the left, on sort of the right, Trump, Biden. What are you expecting? What are you expecting this country? Who are you voting for? Dave Rubin, all these topics. You're friends with Bill Maher. Why don't we let one of the yeah. ladies go first? I've okay. been talking a lot. I'll, I'll Aaron, chime out for a second. Go ahead. Who are you voting for? Thoughts on Trump versus Biden? Voting for Biden. Don't like Trump. Not a fan. Because okay. he's mean? No. I don't care if a politician is mean. I care more about their policies, and I don't think that Donald Trump has a good direction for America. And I don't think that the things that Senator Raskin are saying are just buzzwords, things like autocrat and dictator. Between January 6th and attempted insurrection, 
um, as well as special interest groups like Project 2025 that are attempting to subvert democratic law and the Constitution to keep Trump installed effectively into perpetuity. I don't think that's what most Americans want, and certainly not what I want. And I think that this country is founded on notions of liberty and not um, just you know, top-down, totalitarian, uh, dictat dictatorial rule. Here's what I, my question for you, and I'm not going to do a binary yes or no. Mm -hmm. What can Trump do to earn your vote, and what could Biden do to lose your vote? Is there anything? Yeah, of course. Trump would have to start a major pivot and start embracing a lot more left-wing policies. Like, I don't, I don't see Trump jumping up and down to expand Social Security. I don't see him jumping up and down to uh, help expand labor unions. Things like Biden, Biden uh, actually did help expand labor unions. Trump helped bust labor unions. I'm not a fan of that. Neither are working class people. Um, I don't, unless Trump wanted to make huge pivots like that, which would basically be having mm -hmm. to like exit the Republican Party um, and switching platforms. Yeah, short of that, I don't see him earning my vote. And what can Biden do to lose your vote at this point? Um, Is there anything Biden can do to lose your vote? Yeah, of course, if he started acting more like Trump. <laughs> okay, gotcha, the dictatorial thing. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Padrino? <laughs> Who has your vote as of today? Well, that's a ridiculous question. I mean, <laughs> Biden is not even alive or running the country. He's not he died? Basically, what just happened? And, um, <laughs> Once yeah, away, I just saw him on TV yesterday. Is he, it, yeah. or, or did you? But no, obviously, okay. yeah, I'm gonna vote for Trump, um, and not because I'm hardcore MAGA. It's because I have a brain still in my head. But you mentioned this working class thing, and you guys, you talked about bugs and steak dinners, and we're talking about this like idea of because working class is like between that, right? Mm -hmm. What you don't realize, and everything that we're talking about, these policies are what creates this extreme you know, bug eaters and steak eaters. And there will not be a working class with these policies that you guys claim to like. And that's what you don't see because it's, again, they're short-sighted visions that are like sweet in the moment. But long-term, it's going to create a, a monster. And I, I've seen it happen in different countries. I didn't even realize it was a thing until I went to Mexico. I went to Peru and I saw it. I was like, this is, this is odd. Like I would go and I visit, you know, family or people I know or whatever reason I was going was extreme wealth. But then I see like right around, it was awful. And I didn't experience, I haven't seen that here. I, I mean, it was like ignorant of me and it was years ago, but now it, it made me basically realize like, oh, that is that bad policy that creates that. And it is what is happening here. So it is just something to, you know, make you guys aware of that that working class you're talking about is gonna be completely decimated and we're gonna be having extremes low and extreme high. It's not gonna be, you know, what are we McDonald's and In and Out. It's gonna be, yeah, French laundry and McDonald's. It's gonna be really, really extreme. So um but who am that's I? That's the luxurious for? food. We all know that. I mean that's <laughs> I mean that's nothing's more luxurious yeah. than the fast food. Pixie that was a great point. Where would you uh, where do you see yourself voting as of today? Um, I see myself voting for Biden. I have similar sentiments as Aaron that unless if they completely switch policy positions, then my vote would switch. But obviously, I don't see that happening. Um, to their earlier point about like inequality within the United States and different policy changes, right now, um, to be able to get to the next income bracket, one in 28 Americans will be able to escape the cycle of poverty, essentially. Um, in multiple European countries, it's one in eight. And that's not a coincidence. That's basically based on the fact that our early education system, the way that's currently handled, is based on basically the taxes that you pay around. Um, well, where, where did that stat come from? Uh, I think Center of Global Poverty. I'm not sure. So, um, well, I just break that down to d d distill that for me. Are you saying it's easier to become a millionaire in Europe than it is in the United States? No, 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 not a millionaire. What it is easier to do, what they did, is that they looked at people who are in the lowest possible income bracket, people who are poor, and then they compared it to like, okay, their children, their next generation, are they gonna be in the same bracket? Are they gonna be in the next middle class? Or are they gonna become like super duper rich? And what they saw is that in one in 28, basically children, they were able to get to the next bracket in the United States. While in multiple European countries, I believe Finland, I think the UK and Sweden, if I'm not wrong, um, it was like one in eight. So it's not that they became millionaires, it's just that they were able to escape from the lowest class to the next class. But what's weird, you're saying conflicting things because last week and what you talk about is welfare and things like that. That does not help you elevate. That that keeps it you there. It does so help you though. When it we does look not, at it we, does not. I think you're absolutely coming place from, again, 
sweet thoughts, but not actual reality. If That's why look, I asked you, do you have friends? Do you understand? Like, have you interacted with people and that actually use this system? This is not something they're yes, trying to get out of. This I is know. trying, they're trying to game it and gain more from it. I mean, I, I truly believe this. There is a small percentage. I believe when my family came here, they were on welfare for like a split second. The idea was to get out. Again, we're talking years and years ago. This is a totally different mindset. Now it is to get on it. It's how many kids can I have to, to have more money from it? It's how many, how can I work the system? That's what they're doing. And then they, yes, I wish that their kids would grow up and say, hey, that's what mom did. I don't want that. I want to get out of it. That's what I would like to think. But I think that it perpetuates the cycle of let me depend on the government. Well, I would also say, because you, you've several times referenced Finland and Sweden, and everyone always talks, and Bernie always does this, they talk about the Nordic countries. So mm -hmm. if you want to talk about very tiny, almost all white mm -hmm. countries, if you want the United States to be more like that with a uniculture and a very obvious uh, skin color, um, that's generally not what progressives want. But if, the, if that is what you want America to look like more, that would be an interesting position See if you can find out the population, uh, Humberto, of the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Finland, uh, They're Sweden. absolutely I, tiny, but Sweden, I, by the I, way, I, I Sweden actually, let in, you know, something about it, like a million Muslims, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Now they have huge problems. I mean, try going to Malmo, Sweden and seeing what it's like. And I saw you do a, a reaction video to the Muslim woman in the UK. Who was defending Britain. Who was defending Britain. Yeah. Break that down. Well, it was really fascinating. I wanted to do something that wouldn't be the traditional thing that people would see. I, I can show you a million videos of you know Muslim people wandering through London, screaming from the river to the sea and calling mm -hmm. for genocide and all that. But then I found this video of a woman in traditional Muslim garb talking about how multiculturalism had failed there, that she didn't want the country to be more like the countries that most of these people had come from. Mm -hmm. And that if the more that they import these religious ideas and authoritarian ideas and ideas that are against women and gays and all of these other things, that they are gonna actually destroy Britain and no one will know what Britain is. And I think it's only a matter of time, unfortunately. Britain seems to be heading that way no matter what. I mean, you can't have hundreds of thousands of people marching largely f in calls for genocide in your streets until at some point they're going to cross a threshold and have way too much power. They already have the mayor of London and I think the the more conservative, he's not really conservative, the more conservative prime minister is about to go down. But at some point they'll just march to the to the uh, to the palace and they'll be like, sorry, King, we're, we're taking you out, Charles. And that'll be that. So um, what but, you're saying is but, like, but, but my point of showing yeah. this video was not everyone is like that, which is why you have to care about individuals and not about group. That's identity. what it was. About. But Adam, and I think wait. what you're saying is like Trump was like these shit old countries, you know, if, if you're a normal country, if you're the UK, if you're the Canada, the Australia, you know, democracies, that there's a potential if you take in all these people from these shit old countries that your country could potentially become a shithole. Um, America for 200 plus years, we did it so right that everyone came here and became part of America. Mm -hmm. That's largely why, yes. I'm, you know, I live in Miami where it's all Cubans and I love Cubans, love. I've never Thank met you. a group of people <laughs> that I feel such like when I go to Calle Ocho, like I feel there is such a, like, cause they understand they're usually one generation off it, at least the younger ones that I meet. But like I talk to 80 year olds who like they so get it, right? And America, the promise of America was that you'd, you'd fold into America and yep. that we, we are a melting pot. So you could bring yep. your foods and your traditions and your music and your clothes, yes. but that we would fold into the idea of freedom. That was the melting pot. That was very different than what Europe did because Europe basically brought people in but didn't really have a melting pot. It didn't really sell an idea. America yeah. is an idea. Europe was just like, oh, we're England. You can come here. But, you know, Pakistanis will kind of live here. Mm -hmm. And you people will live here and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, maybe we'll do some business now and again. But you're not going to all share in everything. Mm -hmm. America has done it right until... I would say the last decade where the progressives decided that your skin color and your religion and everything mm -hmm. else is tantamount, is the most important thing in the hierarchy and your, your individual thoughts are actually the least important thing, which again is why I put that video of that Muslim woman up because I was like, oh, this, this flips that on its head. Of course, Before you want to push a, back on the idea about the whole thing of like, oh, welfare doesn't actually help outcomes. Um, when we look at the universal child tax credit and the results that it has like on childhood poverty, we see that it reduces it by half. We see that the long term outcomes when it comes to like, let's say it's food stamps is like one dollar put in one dollar that actually like comes back to the economy because of kids who are able to like grow up healthy, less likely to engage in like behavior like like stealing essentially. 
um, have better, healthier like life outcomes. And then on top of that, I want to say that when it came to the study that I referred to, there was one factor that they changed that made the number more like one to eight in the United States. And that's what, that was basically helping families, assisting families with government assistance to move into better areas and better zip codes, essentially. You mean in, in Europe? No, mean- in, in Europe it was one to eight, but in the United States, what they basically did is that they were like, okay, let's see if we can change this number mm-hmm. or what factors that we can do and if that will like, like affect long-term outcomes. And one of those things was, yes, assisting families to live in better neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So what, is I, it, what does a neighbor, that, that's so interesting. What does that imply when you're saying you move a, to a better neighborhood? What do you mean by better? Why would they not do okay there? If they're, you know, so innately good and they're going to do good with this, what would change about their environment? I mean, th- what, I, I want to understand what you mean by a better neighborhood. So by be- better neighborhoods, we're talking about neighborhoods that were considered like economic hotspots. So neighborhoods that were basically looking like at better growth when it came to general jobs around the area, more businesses, which I'm pro of as well. Um, basically, what would end up happening is that you move the parents to these areas, um, the children would essentially go to a better school, more or less, and the parents would also have more economic opportunity, and so would the children as they're growing up there. So basically, if you want to improve childhood poverty or outcomes in the future, yeah, you can say like, oh, welfare to a certain extent, but also welfare that focuses on bringing these people to better environments where they can then grow and thrive. And that's what, as a progressive, I am for. I'm for giving people those opportunities so they can raise themselves up, not just to be dependent. Right, and then again, that's why the road to hell is paved with good intentions, mm-hmm. because everyone that's for welfare mm-hmm. wants exactly what you just said. But as you said, when your family came here, they were on welfare for a very brief period. That's what it was set up to do. But now we know we keep families in generational welfare. So my sister lived in a building on the Upper West Side that was, you know, like a 40 story building and she was paying market value and it was for a really, she always called it her little shoe box. It was for a one bedroom apartment that she had her husband and two kids in and they paid about five grand a month. But then there were people literally on her floor that were generationally there. So I think it was a third generation that was there that was paying about $350 a month (gasps) because it's in general, they were black, it was generational poverty. They were also given food stamps and everything else. Now this has nothing to do with the color of your skin, but if you were given, if if the government, the government was like, oh, you can have that apartment for 350. Mm. These suckers over there, exactly. they're going to subsidize you for 5,000. You're never going to leave why and you're never you? going to get a job because why would you? That has nothing to do with skin color, by the way. You will. Mm. Why would you be like, you know what? I am going to give up this apart- yeah. great apartment in this nice doorman building in this great area mm-hmm. so I can move, you know, a half hour that way and right. live in a worse place. So again, it's the intentions part. The intentions part are good. Very obvious to me with you. But the outcome of it it's just in in most cases, once you outsource your responsibility, you you ultimately will in, will basically disable your ability to become a functioning part of society. You hear this as well with mothers, right, uh, who are on welfare, who they have a job opportunity and they're like, I don't want to do it because then I will mm-hmm. lose out a portion of my welfare. Like yeah, that yeah. in itself mm-hmm. should really be, it, yeah. it should really highlight how destructive this mindset yeah. is. We have this in Australia as well. It's called the doll. And what I can definitely attest to is that the mindset, the ambition behind the American people compared to Australia, absolutely night and day. So different. Well, uh, uh, listen, uh, I would equate the welfare and the unemployment and the benefits to almost like a drug dealer because they're just going to give you just enough, Mm -hmm. just a little bit for you to come back to buy some more. So my first job out of college, I worked for uh, Clear Channel Radio, which is now iHeartMedia. And uh, it was great. I loved it the first year. Then I kind of just wasn't into it. And eventually they made some cuts and I got fired. So here's what happens. I'm 23 years old. I came from college. I never made any money before. I saved up a couple bucks. You get fired and they go, hey, yeah, fill out these forms. You're going to get unemployment. Sick. Okay. You're going to pay me, I think, like $1,000 a month. Maybe it was two grand a month max. Also, you're gonna get this beautiful little EBT card, AKA food stamps. I'm like, hold on, hold on. You're gonna pay me to just chill and, and eat, do nothing. Eat that luxurious fast food. And eat that food. luxurious fast food that Pixie yeah. talks about. <laughs> but what I realized was, number one, there's a the limits to it. But the best outcome I could have had was like two grand a month mm-hmm. and I don't have to do anything. So at some point you're just sort of rewarding mediocrity and nothingness. So what I realized was, all right, this is cool now, 
But then if you start having kids, oh, they give you a little bit more. And they give you a little bit more. And it's great. But there's nothing aspirational about that. Mm -hmm. So eventually I'm like, all right, I actually got to I'm a, I'm a dude. I got to actually go get, a, go get a job. Eventually I got into the financial f world, got into a financial firm, and quite frankly made millions of dollars. Imagine if I was just like, yeah, I don't want to really do anything. About I'm just going to rely on the government and yep. do that. And I would have just been a mediocre person being rewarded for doing nothing. And that's where, you saw, you know, the, the road to uh, hell. Road, road to hell. Road to hell. Road to hell. Road to hell. Road This is plain and simple. The more they give you, the more they take away. You know, the first thing, the first check you get from them, they take away your spirit. You know, your spirit of trying to become better, do mm -hmm. more things. And they give you more stuff and they take away more stuff. Everything from welfare to like uh, unemployment checks, whatever. They keep on taking, you know, and one day they close everything down and they tell you, you need to stay in your house. Facts. That's what happens. Yeah. It's a slippery slope. And you know about this because you came from a communist country called I know. Chile. I, I want to call Pixie out on this because I saw the whole Norwegian dream thing playing out in two years in Chile. Like they promised Norway for everyone that everything's gonna, everything is gonna be great. Everyone. We're gonna have schools. We're gonna have uh, healthcare and whatever. And in two years, they destroy the country. All the memes that you see from the right in Chile, yeah. they're Norwegian dreams. Like they go like, oh, how Scandinavian of them when they're shitting on the street. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. Because that doesn't work. And I grew up in Dubai with a bunch of you know wealthy Europeans, and I will visit visit them in their country, their home country. And the lifestyle they had in Dubai with no taxes and the lifestyle they have in Europe is way different. Like, the, the, the pretty wealthy families have shoe boxes. They have one car. You know, like, it's, it's a cold, complete different ball game. Mm -hmm. And what happened to your people, Amy, mm -hmm. they didn't tell the British to kick rocks, you know? Yep. Like, what makes us Americans is, is to tell the British to kick Just rocks. To we're going to do it our own way. Yep. That's why this is the best mm. country in the world. That's, that's what why it I'm is. Here. That's why I'm here. That's why he's here. It that's also, why your families. That's why yeah. we're all here. It also disincentivizes good people who might do some good things from doing anything because you think the government is going to do everything for everybody. So, like, so for example, if you, guys, if you guys are into these ideas, like how much do you donate per year to poor people or disadvantaged or whatever? I assume you have a job. You yeah. have a job? Yeah. So, like, how much? 5% of your salary? Uh, I'm not sure. Every time I'm presented at like a checkout thing where they're like, do you want to round up your total? Give a dollar here, a dollar there. It's usually when I make like, you know, charitable contributions. So there. probably about 10 to $20 this year, every time you're rounding up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Probably, probably awesome. something, <laughs> something like that. So you care, you care a lot about these people. You want the government to do it, to take it from other people. But you give yeah, a few cents Yeah, because if charity per... defeated poverty, we would have gotten rid of poverty a long time ago. There have been charitable organizations for hundreds of years, but that's not a reliable way to help people actually have economic mobility. Well, they it's been totally proven jobs. that capitalism around the globe has lifted people out of poverty, mm -hmm. and socialism and communism has only put people deeper into poverty. That's not it. That's objectionably true. What were you going to say about this? About No, about giving checks and people staying home. Yeah. So we experienced this firsthand at the restaurant during 21 when everybody was getting paid to stay home. Because to your point, if I'm spending $350, i am not going to spend $5,000 for an apartment. If I'm staying home and I'm making whatever thousands and it was a good amount at the time, why would I go work? But what you don't realize is the ripple effects. Like we could have gone under. I was working as a server. Like we made it work because we had enough people that we were able to make it work. But nobody wanted to work. So you, the, what you realize is like businesses and clo everything is closing because nobody wants to work. So it's there's ripple effects that you will never feel, and that's back to the original point. You're young and you're sweet, but you have to live a little bit to experience these things, and then be like, no, absolutely not. Okay, I I can't have a business because they're staying home because they don't want to come to work. Right, get, get Natalia in here yeah. for equity. No, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Natalia in here, but this is what I want to do. I maybe this just comes down to. You know, they say nature versus nurture. Maybe this is just human nature here in America. Because there's a stat out there that I want Humberto to show, if you can pull this up, about who basically identifies with more liberal and who identifies with more conservative. Do you have that stat right there, yes, Humberto? Sir. One second. So it's very interesting. And Natalia, you know, uh, I want to get your perspective on this. By the way, are you voting more Trump or you voting more Biden? I'm registered independent, but I'm definitely a little bit more on the, the Trump side. You're allowed to speak with your chest, girl. Yeah, no, okay. I know, like I know. But I'm like, like, I like, to, hear, I like to watch off. kind of this conversation, okay. like, you know, open up with everybody. It's interesting. There you go. Um, yeah, pull up this stat. This is super interesting to me because basically what this stat shows is the following. It breaks down by gender and marital status whether you identify with more a Republican or a Democrat. And I'll, I'll give the disclaimer. A lot of things have changed since Obama, Trump, 
Biden, like the Republicans went a little more right, Democrats went more left. Republicans used to stand for more the millionaire, limousine type driving country club guys, whereas the Democrats were more the union workers, everything like that. Now things have kind of swapped. But if you look at these stats, um, so it goes married men, it's about 60-40, okay? 59% Republican, 39% Democrat, 60-40, cool. Married women, interesting, 56% more Republican, 42% Democrat, almost in that 60-40 range. Unmarried men, what I am, well, you know, these days, more likely to be Republican than Democrat, 52. But here's the big thing, and this yeah. is why the uh, Democrats play so hard on the Roe versus Wade, my body, my choice. It's like their calling card. It's the reason that Republicans, quite frankly, lost the midterm elections because they did the whole Dobbs decision. 68%, Humberto, pull that up. 68%, the highest number by far, identify with Democrats mm -hmm. versus Republicans, 31. So basically, if you're a man, if you're a married man, if you're a woman who's married, you're going to be a little bit more conservative side of things. If you're just one of those wild, unmarried, liberal women out there, you're going to identify more with the Democrats. <laughs> Dave, have concerned. you well, seen no, this? They're telling you, I mean, yeah. what it's really saying is sort of miserable middle-aged women are Democrats. But there's a reason for that. If you haven't got married and you don't have kids and you haven't figured out some system outside of yourself, mm -hmm. you're going to lean more on a system mm -hmm. that you think is going to work for you. And ironically, that's the system that's going to work the least for you because mm -hmm. look at the Democrats' positions. Like, do you think it's great to have gang members entering the country en masse who are going to unleash rape and crime and make it unsafe for women to go on the subway in New York City, et cetera, et cetera? So there is a deep connection between not having a sort of solid unit in your own home mm -hmm. and, and hoping, it's just the hope, that the system is going to take care of you, and, and clearly the evidence shows that it doesn't. But it's mm -hmm. that that's the disconnect. It's between the reality of what's mm -hmm. going on, what the policies actually do, and just the hope that, oh my God, these Democrats are nicer and blah, blah, blah. And by the way, the your body, your choice thing, it's like, yeah, they were for your body, your choice, except when it came to COVID. Yeah, what happened with the Inject with the everybody situation. with all of this experimental what's medication. And, yeah. Yeah. All right, Sorry, now, let me bring Nat in here. Where our our uh, ESG and DEI score is about to go shoot up to the, the moon <laughs> at this point because the beautiful Natalia Davai is here. You know, I'll never forget the first conversation I had with your dad, yeah. stepfather, yeah. dad. He pulls me, as, we're at Dallas Cowboy Stadium. PBD invites me, this is when I'm living in Dallas. Mm -hmm. We're literally on the field. On the field, Bo Jackson's out there. We're That's like running cool, routes. Though. It's super, super cool. I've never met your dad at this yeah. point. I didn't, like this is 2020, I didn't know. He comes up, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Yeah. He's from Honduras, Honduras. okay. Yeah. How could you possibly vote for Joe Biden? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I said, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know you. This yeah. is before Nat was here he was on the show. He was prepared. He's like, I got to talk to He's Adam. Like, I said, okay, <laughs> no, nice to meet you too, random guy I've never met before. Okay. okay, let me tell you who I am. And like went down. I said, all right, great. Probably not the best way to start a conversation. <laughs> but here's a guy who is so staunch anti-communist, anti-socialist, that what happens is, you know, Biden, uh, Biden basically campaigned on being a moderate, bringing people together, being a unifier. Not didn't really work out that way. But what happens is when you come from these countries, mm -hmm. whether it's Cuba, whether it's Venezuela, Honduras, Honduras you smell what is happening. Mm -hmm. It yeah. smells like a little communism. I don't yeah. like this. I don't like this at all. They're taxing more, more overreach, more regulation. I don't like it. This is what this guy's right, about to freak out right quick, now. I can't even control it right quick. now. Mm -hmm. Can't like even control it. So Natalia, what have you learned from your dad? What have you learned also growing up in Florida? What, how did, what shaped your political viewpoint? Yeah, no, great question. It's funny because I grew up with friends who are a little bit more on the the, the left side. Yeah. And so with you're hanging out with that BLM crowd. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I know. You know, I, I met, it wasn't really our with topic of conversation, but you know, growing up, you know, with kind of that being pushed in my head during school, you know, I I didn't really have that insight. But as I 
spent more time with my family and I was able to be grown up in a household with a mom, a dad, a sibling, watching everybody work. My parents, my mom used to be a banker. My dad used to be an entrepreneur in New York. Um, and then they moved to Florida and they did real estate and they went more into that, you know, business owner route and now they own their own business. Um, they've owned a few businesses. Um, to see that grind, to see that hustle, you see like they work in a sense of fear, like we don't want to be like where I came from. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad didn't come in on a boat, you know, he came in fighting for his life. And so when you have that fear of that's what the world can turn into, you value more work. Mm -hmm. You value more of, hey, I come from nothing. We have to make sure we don't go back. And what's also important is like, look, you see the unmarried women where they stand and it's because they also don't have that support system. So they're looking for a support system. Mm -hmm. You know, if they find a husband that's able to support and lead and, you know, be able to protect the family, why would they rely somewhere else for a support system? Because it's actually in the home you know I'm a woman that I you know I come from a family where my dad is kind of the example of the type of man that I would want to have in my household so you know I'm also a woman coming from I technically really don't need a man because I have my dad being that man in my life right now but now what happens is that my standard of a man is at that level mm -hmm. I'm looking for a man to be able to lead the household I'm looking for a man to hey when in doubt if we're get to a point you're on welfare for a little bit months we get out I don't want to be relying on someone else other than my family Preach. that's able to get out of it yeah. so it's a different perspective I grew up very very fortunate you know it's funny because I have a friend who grew up with a, a great family then I have a friend who didn't grow up like a very broken home she d only has her dad in the household and you can see the different way that they're raised you can see the different things that they value because of it and you know it's just interesting to see in the time of people are looking for that security people are looking for that place where they can feel safe and when you're relying on places just to give your money, like, please take care of me, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee of the return. So when you can control your income, you can mm. control what you do every day, you can control what your family has, you have control of your life. And so as soon as you start giving that out, you're losing the control that you give out. Mm. So nice very, very nice. fortunate. Well said, Natalia Del nice Valle out there. W Nat. Yeah. This is not my money, but I want you to have yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, because you. of what you just said. I know you don't even want it, but yeah. I want you to have it. There you go. That's right. Job, like, like a true socialist. Yeah, Dave Rubin just took <laughs> my money. Took your money. Took my money. Gave it to somebody it who doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. Doesn't yeah. need waste it. it on a bunch of There it was. Well, uh, you know, Amy, one time you told a story about how when you were younger, um, you know, you were more the boss babe mode. You were doing it by yourself and you developed sort of these masculine traits. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then as you realize, as you grew a little bit older, you're like, you know what, I want to be a little, be a little bit more feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that evolution for you? Um, I wouldn't say that it was uh, any type of like political evolution. That was just more personal stuff, uh, you know, going on at the time. I definitely fell into a little bit of the feminist propaganda. You're an independent woman who don't need no man, you know, just take care of yourself. And so I was very money driven. I was very success driven. And, you know, in accomplishing a lot of those financial goals, yeah, I did develop some more masculine qualities. And, you know, at the end of the day, the type of man that I want, a man that you just described, Nat, a man that will make you feel safe, secure, protected and provided for in your own home, he doesn't care about any of that stuff. In fact, a lot of the qualities that I was cultivating would probably be unattractive to that type of man or even repel him. And so I realized like, girl, money isn't everything. Yes, money's really important, but I've made money. I've lost money. I've realized that's not what's gonna make my soul happy. What makes me happy is eventually having that long-term family unit having just like the more spiritual things in life, a relationship with God, and knowing that I'm actually uh, fighting for something I believe in that's gonna help people in the long term, like we do on this show. That's what I'm passionate and about. And you'll be surprised, guys, my heart also, is palpitating. Oh, you'll also you're be, right? you're you're be surprised, you're surprised, right? you're you're surprised say, how Laura? many men because today. that's what I want young girls to think. I want everyone to think exactly that, and you came to it on your own. You came mm -hmm. to it maybe like, you know, a roundabout Trial way. Trial and error, for sure. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. and then you saw it modeled, but the point is it works. And mm -hmm. you know, I say this all the time. When I say conservative, this is what I mean. It's conserving family values. Mm -hmm. It's conserving these things. It's it's a little bit gender roles, but it's not, because I work and I also have a family. I'm able to do all the things, yep. but it's, there. at the end of the day, there's like values there and there has to be that. Priorities. It's mm -hmm. prioritizing those priorities there. Values. So yes. I, I just, I love to hear what you guys are saying and I want everybody 
to think this and feel the same way and maybe one day you guys will come around. Well, you know, I, I don't know if you would feel I like that. I was going to wait till the end to do the happy ending and do okay. more relationship talk. Relationship I feel like it's a good talk? thing. Yeah. You can pull Goodly up that stat way. because I want to get the girls on this and then bring in this story with Lily Allen. Uh, if you can just mm. show up those uh, oh, yeah, uh, the Republican so Democrat stats. So, um, you know, far be it for me to say, this is how you got to live your life. This is how you're going to do it. Like right. everyone, individualism, right. rugged individualism. But when you see these stats about, you know, unmarried women, they're going to vote liberal, but the more married women, family oriented, they're going to vote more conservative. Um, this thing right here, mm -hmm. obviously you guys are in that top right blue situation. <laughs> what are the chances you're going to be over there in that 56% married woman and maybe adjust? Like what's your overall goal, your outcome? Where do you see yourself? Because you're 25? Yeah, I'm 24. I apologize. How, they, how, <laughs> oh how ageist of me. That's horrible. And how old are you? I'm 25. Way off here, guys. Where do you, when do you see yourself settling down, being a Laura Padrino, family, kids? When do you see that happening? Um, what is it? I definitely want to end up having a family and children. I think um, around 30 would be good for me. Um, I don't see necessarily like any younger, maybe getting married around like 29 or something. Most of my family, um, funny enough, is conservative, and most of them have gotten married around 30s. Um, it's also what has the highest like likelihood of being able to like basically lower likelihood of divorce higher likelihood of like having a healthy family structure so that's why i think around that age mm -hmm. how about you when you see these stats where do you see yourself what's your outcome well i'm in a happy relationship with my boyfriend he's at like and cooks online and we've been together for eight months and we plan on getting married probably later this year so you want to have kids him. oh I'm gonna try that's, kids. that's yeah. amazing that's look at amy awesome. that was like one of those spiteful yeah it's no amazing. it's not <laughs> They're a great yeah. couple. I've been to dinner with these guys. That's awesome to hear you guys are doing so. A luxurious guys. dinner? Very, it was actually amazing. Luxurious. 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 I, I only have luxurious, luxurious dinners at Padrino's Cuban. You know, Pull up this uh, story real quick about Lily Allen. If you remember her, uh, big time singer in the early to mid 2000s, British girl. Um, and it's funny, this is why you kind of got to watch the clip before you're reading the headline. But the headline was, Lily Allen, what's the best way to describe her? Like an Amy Winehouse type? Mm. Like, dare I say, like a Taylor Swift-ish, but not on that scale, but in the UK. She says that having children totally ruined her career. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And that, and that women, specifically uh, parents, but specifically women, can't have mm -hmm. it all, and career coaches say she's right. As you're teeing up this clip, Humberto, let me know when you're ready. Lily Allen openly discusses the impact of parenthood on her career, bluntly stating, yes, my children ruined my career and you can't have it all. Can you play this clip? I want to say oh. she called them an anchor. Mm -hmm. Like it's, oh, well, maybe she's going to say it in the clip. Wow. And she's got daughters. So it really just. But hold on, there good. might be a different ending. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I heard it was taken out of context. Oh, oh it's a paywall. Oh, no. We don't have it. No. It's paywall. You know what other. You can Google, you can find that on YouTube. You know Let me know what other it's stat up. you should be scared of too, though? You should be scared of the unmarried men stat. That's a close stat. It's a 16% difference. And that's very, very scary. Why? Because what's happening now is you're also having men who are not able to provide, and they're also now starting to lean more onto that side of things. I was actually in a relationship where suggesting was, hey, uh, I may apply for this, and I may apply for this, and I'm thinking like, uh, yeah. I've never ever considered applying for anything like that. And so as I see a stat like that, I'm thinking, wow, you know, unmarried men are even saying, hey, I need support, I need security. I'm like, mm -hmm. you're supposed to provide the security with your wife and your family. So that's a stat that I don't want to also overlook because today that number is changing. Well, who says that man is supposed to provide? Men are supposed to provide. Well, what do you you're, mean? You guys are stronger, you guys are faster, you guys are no. smarter, you guys are, yes, you guys we're, are doing all those things. The men things. are supposed to stay home and take care of the baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, definitely yeah. not. I've what are you saying right now, I've been in a relationship <laughs> where I come home and they're vacuuming and I I'm busting my ass at work and I don't mind doing that. Okay. But my point is, is that there has to come to a point, well, if I'm going to be bringing home the money and I'm going to be doing that, I'm going to have the decisions. So I don't need him telling me, oh, let's go try and do this and this and get support here. That's honestly the most unattractive thing a guy could ask me to do. Yeah. <laughs> is this the really clip? Had a strategy when it comes to career. Uh, but yes, my children ruined my career. <laughs> 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 I mean, I love them oh, and they complete me, hilarious. but in terms of like, you know, pop stardom, totally ruined it. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's such a good answer. <laughs> 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 I'm so happy to hear someone say that. Everyone's like, no, of course not. Does not mix. Mm. And, and really annoys me when people say you can have it all because, quite frankly, you can't. You can't. And maybe you, know, you some can't. Some people you choose their well. career over their children, and that's their prerogative. But, you know, my parents were quite absent when I was a kid. And I feel like that really left some like nasty scars that I'm not willing to, you know, to repeat so on mine. Good. And so I chose stepping back and concentrating on them. And I'm glad that I've done that because I think they're pretty well-rounded people. So it's interesting. Well, it's interesting because yes. she comes they around. Did. At yes. the yeah. end, she's telling you, okay, well, first off, life is a series of trade-offs. Nothing comes it, without a cost, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody has some version of that, whether it's kids or a job or something. If you do something that's worthwhile, it's going to cost you something uh -huh. on the other side. But her answer there is quite good. She's yeah. going, well, I came from a family where the parents weren't around a lot, yeah. so mm -hmm. I made a choice. So, yes. okay, she didn't become... Uh, Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. but she, but people obviously know who she is. Not my mm -hmm. thing, but like people know who she is. She probably made a little bit of money, and now she's a good mother. Like so, great, happy ending, fantastic, right. great story. Well, I remember uh, speaking with the guy Chris Williamson before, and he gave a speech. He was talking about you have to choose your regrets, and mm -hmm. what is more salty as someone that can't necessarily have kids at this point, mm -hmm. or the old man shouting at the sky, "I wish that I would have done something with my life." Right. Choose your regrets. So there's a lot of young women mm -hmm. that are going to basically regret some of the feminist ideology they've uh, been fed. And I've seen it firsthand because I'm a little bit older than you, 24 and 25 year olds. <laughs> I have friends, girlfriends of mine, who were, I'm telling you, the hottest chicks in high school, in college. The hot, like, guys are lining up to get these girls' numbers, lining up to date them. And one of them, like, I'm talking like Queen B, hottest chick. She didn't pull the ripcord soon enough. Now she's in her early 40s and she's having a child mm. with herself. Mm. She went, doesn't have a man, got an embryo, however this whole frozen egg situation works. And now she's having a baby with herself. If you ask yourself, is that the life that you want? I'm not putting you in this position because you said you're going to have kids with your guy or get married with your guy. I don't know about kids. But that's what the future is going to hold. Now, guys, you can wait a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But I've interviewed guys like Mike Rowe, yeah. who's 60 plus, super stud, yeah. doesn't want kids. Cool. Bill Maher, loud and proud, doesn't want kids. Jordan, but you're, you're Jordan, a father. Yeah, but You've I, got waited, two kids. I, I waited till I was 46. I'm 47 now. Mm -hmm. And although it's fine, like in retrospect, maybe could I have done it earlier? Sure. When I toured with Jordan Peterson, I mean, one of the things he talked about all the time was that to live a fully actualized life as a human being, it is so fundamental to have kids and then hopefully also become a grandparent because mm -hmm. that basically builds Jacob's ladder. Mm -hmm. So that like builds between what's like here right now and heaven. Like that if you enter a union with someone and you're like, we'll make this better, whatever, whatever uh, union, marriage, mm -hmm. that you will make your lives better. You will push each other to be better. Then you will bring children into this world. Hopefully those children have children. Mm -hmm. Like that actually is the thing that life is really all about. And he would make a point that it is so fundamental to, to being a human that almost everybody absolutely needs it. Now, are there some like crazy exceptions? I would say Bill Maher might be the closest, um, in ter but, but Bill Maher, mm -hmm. 67 years old who, and I don't mean any of this judgmentally towards him, I, I mean this actually with love. 67 years old, did exactly what he wanted to do for a living, like, right, became, yep. wanted to become a star. He always said from when he was a kid, he wanted to be like Hugh Hefner, basically. So he became super rich, he became super famous, uh, says what he wants for a living, which he puts at like the primacy of everything, right? Um, is he possibly still missing something along the way? quite probably okay. but it's pretty damn close that maybe he will be at the end and by the way when he ends when he's at the bed at the end like it's not going to be his kids around him it's not mm -hmm. going to be yeah he mm -hmm. always says he has one sister left that's all he's got like mm -hmm. he's also an atheist like it's it's very lonely in a certain way mm -hmm. um but if you do the other thing if you have kids and then hopefully you have their, you know, their kids have kids. Then you start building something that is rich and deep. And if you want to get to that 68% of women that vote Democrat, I mean, look at Kathy Griffin. Look at Chelsea Handler. Oh, look man. at Sarah Silverman. Look at these women who put everything into their careers and they're single and childless and miserable and angry and progressive. And there is a reason yes. that they are those things. And the, the, what's interesting about that, because I had a very public feud with Chelsea, because I cited the stat. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We Morgan that Stanley. On my show, I said, yeah. look, these are the numbers. Yeah. You know, 45% of working women by 2030, which ain't that far away, ladies, mm -hmm. are going to be unmarried, no kids, no family. Uh, and they're also the highest 
likelihood to be on medications. And then mm -hmm. Chelsea Handler popping pills, drinking vodka at 9 a.m. She's like, how dare you criticize what I'm saying? I'm like, that's exactly what Look, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. She literally put up a video. She's exactly. like, I masturbated six times yeah. today. I drank, I took my pills. Yeah. I masturbated again and drank. And then she's like, exactly. and look at Congratulations, me. Congratulations, yeah. Chelsea. You did what I did when I was 19. Yeah. You didn't right. grow up. Yeah. But all, right. for all the Chelsea Handlers right. and the Kathy Griffins of the world and the Sarah Silverman's world, we know these people, we know their names. But the Sarah, the Mary, the Christina, that you have no clue they are, mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, girl, you got it. They're home alone, like Macaulay Culkin, mm -hmm. and there's nothing you could do. But what's crazy about Bill Maher, and this is why I don't, you know, men and women are not the same, yes. the, AKA equal the same. Bill Maher could still literally have a kid. Right. Yeah. Literally today at 67 years old. Yeah. Al Pacino just had a kid. Robert yeah. De Niro had a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep banging, old man. Yeah. But after 35, 40 years old, ladies, that clock, that biological clock, the ticking is done. So, but Bill Maher is one of the examples of somebody that doesn't regret it. But Larry Elder, that you're familiar with, he yeah. does mm -hmm. kind of say that he regrets it. Yeah. And I think oh, he Larry Elder never had kids. No, he never had kids. He no. never. What? No, he, he said it on the show. I think yeah. he said he regrets it, and he would have been, I think, a fantastic father and had yeah. a lot to contribute to it. And that's so. not. And again, that's why it's not that it's a perfect thing that Jordan's saying that you, you, if you don't have kids, you cannot live a, right. a, a, a mm -hmm. perfectly actualized right. life. But, but it's, it's so fundamental yes. that virtually everybody, and if you, anyone, anyone that's lost a grandparent at the end if you've mm -hmm. been around your grandparent like I remember when my grandma died and she was like the true matriarch of our mm -hmm. family and all the grandchildren were there mm -hmm. at the end and they pulled the plug and you know once they pulled the plug you, you could die like that mm -hmm. or maybe a few hours and we had about eight hours where everyone was coming from all over the country mm -hmm. and then by the end it was like basically like a storybook miracle yeah. all the grandchildren got there all the children got there cried left ate blah, blah, and then and then she was gone it was like yeah. man and then at the end my brother turned to me and he was like, he was like, whoa, that, that was an incredible day, which mm -hmm. is what a crazy thing to say when your grandma dies. But like, it was like, oh, her life ended exactly how it was supposed to. You know what's crazy? Yeah. This, uh, not to bring Andrew Tate into this situation, but one of the more viral clips he's ever sat, he's ever basically discussed, was he's like, you know, when your grandma dies, mm -hmm. you know, and the whole family is gathering around at her funeral, the matriarchy of the family, Everyone's there and you see the dozens of offspring and the kids and the grandkids. Nobody asked one time what grandma did for work. Yeah. <laughs> she was just grandma. Mm. And that's what it is. And women are mm. judged, their beauty objects and their feminine beauty objects and their maternal and that's what their nurturers and men are status objects. You don't like name, okay, how about this? What is the name? of the vice president right now of America. Kamala there, Harris. Okay, what's her husband's name? Not sure, the first, the second man of the oh, United States, I guess. Mr. It's Harris. Harris. Mr. Harris. It's, I think Mr. it's Harris. Harris. But I don't I think, think, it, I don't think I don't it is Harris. I don't think she took his... I no, think it's Emhoff. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. that's yeah. my point. Yeah. 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 That's my point, you just proved my point. The dude, you have no clue who this dude is, but what's Donald Trump's wife's name? Melania. Yeah. Okay, what's... um. Uh, Joe, Joe Biden's wife's name? Jill. Okay, so it just proves Dr. Jill that when the doctor. man She's has success, <laughs> you're going to know his wife's name. Him. When the woman has success, you don't know that dude's name. You don't know the vice president's. He's the first gentleman of the history of the United States. How dare you not know Doug M. Hoff's name? She called him <laughs> Mr. Harris. Well, yeah, sir, she to be fair, ridiculous. I don't know most vice presidents. Um, what Spouse, is that? I don't know Spouse, Mike Pence's yeah. wife's name. Yeah. It's, you know, that, that I don't think people true. are really like paying that much attention. But like on the parenthood note, I couldn't disagree with Dave and you more, honestly. Like there are so many stats showing that like Married couples that don't have kids, AKA like dinks, dual income, no kids, actually report being happier on average than parents that. Circle back in five, 10 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Circle back. Say, how long? They're happy now. Mm -hmm. No, they're happy no now. I mean, think about it. There's so many There's also stats ways. that show the highest medicated people yeah. are women, mm -hmm. childless, 40 plus. Explain that. Well, I'm not going to get into like correlation equal causation, Ooh, but like. Well, you just did. Oh, you just gave me the dink thing. Was, Fixie last week. No, no, no. yeah. I'm just saying what they report being happy, and it makes a How lot of sense. How happy would you to be if you got married? I'd be and happy. you had a great job. I'd be happy. And you had no kids, and you just had two stuffed animal dogs in your house the rest of your life. Hey, I have a real dog, and no, her name's okay. Okay. Yes, they How happy would you be? Like I'd be very happy. If that You'd was... be very happy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if I, I could I challenge you to never have kids. <laughs> Don't do that. I would, I would no, not wish you. that on you. No, no please, I, please. I think, I think I hope there's your mind credence changes. to what Aaron is saying because let's be honest, in our current state of the United States, um, 
it's very difficult for people to survive on a one income, right? So usually you have to have the mother and the father working, That's right? That's true. Um, and this is where I part with conservatives a lot because we let's go back to the welfare discussion again, basically, where it's like, yeah, you know what? Like, obviously there has to be caps, but we should monetarily incentivize women to take care of their children, to not have to like go out and get that dual income if you believe in a traditional family structure. So in one hand, you can say like, Might oh, lower taxes on everybody, let them keep more there, of their money. There's multiple right. ways to do it. But the point of the fact is that even now, like most people. Parents cannot survive on just a one income household. So we should be helping poor mothers. We should be helping mothers in general be able to get that well, extra income to stay home. What's the fine line between helping and then just doing it for them? And that's, you know what? That's up to debate. And I'm okay with having, like, we can go down, look at stats. We can look at, like, hey, you know, once it gets to, like, this number, then it seems to have adverse effects. But the reason why I bring it up is because... I think part of our duty as citizens in the United States is to make our government work for us. And I think that's one way to do it, to be like, hey, you know what? We should incentivize, if we believe in a traditional family household, uh, mothers to stay at home through this measure that can also help poverty. I, 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 I think what you're saying actually makes a lot of sense because they're trying to lower uh, the free education to pre-K now. Yeah. I think if there's anything that Republicans and, and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, that you know, Universal making sure the kids are okay. Right. Yeah, I don't think there's a you know. That, no, a, I'd be against that because you would why be against would, yeah, it. Why would I want more kids in state education? Why 100%. would I want more kids being educated by the people that are confusing them about their the most, yeah. 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 most people can't afford private schools. But yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what she's saying. Most people can't afford to come out of pocket. Okay. Yeah. And pre-K, that, does, you're not even learning tough. anything in pre-K. I mean, it just functions as childcare. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I would, pref I want everyone to get as good an education as possible, but it has nothing to do with sending the government, sending everyone to government schools, uh -huh. where they're going to learn all of the wrong things, which is yep. why Generation Z, uh, Generation Gen Z, Gen yeah. Z, yeah. is so confused about so many basic. You, you bring truths. up a good point because I'm still thinking that when I went to school, everything was normal. That's yeah. a thing. Yeah. You know, the, you thing that, the, the worst thing that happened to me is my teacher would literally hit me with a ruler. Yeah. And pull my ear. Like, that would be yeah. a cancel society. Probably what a good you, thing in hindsight. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good guy. What do I have? I got a year on you, right? You're 46? What are you? 40, you what are you, 43? <laughs> <or 43? laughs> I got three. I got four okay. years on you. You but, remember when we used to get beaten in elementary school, Dave? But nobody, nobody, I used to beat guys like you, but nobody, <laughs> but nobody that is over, if you're if you're basically 35 to 55 in America, nobody thought racism was cool, nobody thought homophobia was yeah. cool, right. nobody thought, well, and it, we, we were done with all of this. It's mm -hmm. not to say there weren't little things that could be mm -hmm. changed on the margins and things like that, mm -hmm. but we were done with all of this, which is why I always say, if we could just go back to 1995, yep. mm -hmm. we basically had everything solved. Mm -hmm. I would wow. say gay marriage was the last thing that, that actually provided equality, that was the last hurdle there, mm -hmm. and then unfortunately the activists just couldn't let it go, and now we've mm -hmm. ended up with a series of other things. But but we were done, we really were done, we had mm -hmm. done it, and then unfortunately, the progressives came in and said, we want more, we want more, we want now more. Now we need to cut off kids' dicks. And now we have to cut off kids' dicks. <laughs> yeah. And who was the president in 1995? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton. <laughs> yeah. there's your blowjob theory right there. There, there is the blowjob theory. We're talking, we're talking yeah, yeah. about What's the Will Smith was, a, was, was the man back then? Now he's feminized. Well, my blowjob theory is basically based in the stat that you showed right there. We yes. talked about it on PBD this morning. The the blowjob theory is that most men actually lean a little more conservative, and there's lots of biological and realistic reasons for that. But women tend to be more lefty, mm -hmm. and at some point, men just want to get a blowjob. So if your wife is a little more lefty and Democrat, as a man, you end up shutting up about it because you just would like a blowjob. And I think that that's completely legit. And I know a lot of people like that. And you some will make the case week? that the best way to shut a woman up is <laughs> to saying, guys, Adam, Adam, is Adam, to hear Adam. her out and uh, let's see what she has yeah, to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I, one last point here. I saw, uh, in case you haven't noticed, big fan of Dave. Watch all his stuff. Uh, fan of everyone that he has around him. Uh, one of the people that you have around you in your orbit is this lady, Isabel Brown, this girl, yeah, yeah. right? I think she's yeah. engaged. Love her, yeah, to my social media guy, Brock. Yeah. Exactly. By total to coincidence, Brock. yeah. Oh. Random, but yeah. she's going to be on, I don't know, in the next few weeks when she's in town, what have you. But you sat down and have a conversation about her. She's in the Gen Z camp. She wrote a book yeah. called The End of the Alphabet, How Gen Z Can Save America. Now, this was interesting to me because I think there's a lot of 
evidence that shows Gen Z is ruining America, especially from the education standpoint, from the LGBT, like you're more likely to be part of the LGBT community than a Republican and all this. But it was interesting, some of the stuff she was talking about, especially about the dating side of things, mm -hmm. how that's sort of, they're trying to be a little bit more counterculture these days, stick it to the man, Gen Z rebellion, I believe she called it. They're getting off the dating apps. They're trying to be a little more traditional. Uh, what did you learn from that conversation? Well, I, I love her and I do a second show now every day with her and I, I just think she's fantastic. And she's 27, I'm 47. So we have a 20 year gap between us, which is kind of kind of why I wanted to do the show with her yeah. to figure out like what's between us. And it's interesting because right now, the way things are in America, we've got Joe Biden, let's say, versus Donald Trump. It's like we have baby boomers that should be retired. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden should be a grandpa and retired. Nancy Pelosi should be a grandma mm -hmm. and no one should know what she does for a living and all that. <laughs> but the boomers have not let go. So they're mm -hmm. still, and, and that's a function of science and technology and medicine that has Living allowed longer. these people to live longer. And then they're not getting to what the fruition of life is, which is then you let go and you let the next generation take over. Mm -hmm. Gen uh, Gen X, which is our generation, is should be in charge right uh, now. For right? the record, I'm the oldest millennial. You, yeah. Are you? Are you? Oh, like, you know, you're trying to loop me into you, Gen yeah. Xers. Yeah. Right. Well, you boomer. Have a little respect for your elders. Then. Um, <laughs> now, Larry Gen Alden. X, right? Gen X should be in charge right now. Elon. Elon Musk yep. and and someone say between 40 and 55 should be running the country right now. It's obvious mm -hmm. that because you have more skin in the game, your children are going to grow DeSantis, up. Ron DeSantis, say Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes, all okay. of them. Vivek is probably even Gen Y. No, or, he's or millennial. millennial he's, or he's millennial, yeah. right? So, so unfortunately, they held on for too long. It's now so we've sort of jumped Gen X, and then what was then it was Gen Y or what they call yeah. millennials. Mm -hmm. They kind of got jumped over, and then we've put all of this emphasis on Gen Z. I don't blame Gen Z for anything. I'm actually pretty sympathetic to Gen Z because they grew up with all of the wrong ideas. So it's easy to make fun of them. But the beauty of, of Isabel and, and what she writes about in the book is that they actually are now reversing course on all of this stuff for the 10 years that every girl was like, I'll be on OnlyFans and never date and, mm -hmm. and, and hookup culture and all those things, which by the way, we were all part of, we all did, we've all done shit. It's all, it's, it is what it is. But they're getting to the end of all of these bad ideas, the bad ideas mm -hmm. of third wave feminism, the bad ideas that tech has just handed them everything, that you should just be given things, all of the things that Bernie pushed and several of the things that we've talked about here. And they're actually now leaning more conservative Conservative. And as she said on my show, it doesn't mean conservative like you have to exactly believe in the same God and have all of the same practices and all of those things. Um, but it's that you you will have some more skin in the game, more responsibility mm -hmm. for yourself, an understanding of how this country was set up, and not just believe that the system is going to take care of you when actually the system is really designed to just make you chum in the water. I'm such an eloquent speaker, this guy. But this is why I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with Isabel, because I don't necessarily if I agree with her conclusions. I don't know. I haven't read the book. Because, I mean, you can find this article from The Hill about how Gen Z boys are trending more conservative and Gen Z girls or high school girls are trending more liberal. Yeah, we but also most of the girls are turning like into boys. Yeah. So over time, uh -huh. that'll work itself. Yeah, you got it, you got it. Yeah. Chicks with dicks, I forgot yeah. about it. I totally forgot about it. But yeah, I don't, I don't see that. I see a lot of young men. Isabel, if you hear this, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I see a lot of young men gravitating more towards the Tates of the world, the... Uh, Joe Rogans of the world, the Jordan Petersons of the world, the Fresh and Fits of the world, the PBD, the Value yep. Team. I see more of that. And I see more of the women, shout out to these girls, going down the Chelsea Handler hookup culture OnlyFans route. I don't believe in so hookup I don't culture. Know. <laughs> okay, well, you better, girl. Do you have that stat from the Hill? Humberto, you yeah, have that I, staff? I got, Pull this up. I got graphs. I don't you got graphs. There, there's good. something, uh, go to the actual article. Uh, because, yeah. The new, I don't know if this is from The Hill, that says Financial Times, but. This is a Gallup study that has shown the divide between sexes. Okay, but if you go to that Hill article, you'll see the, the actual divide. But the point is, the boys are going more conservative, mm -hmm. the girls are going more liberal. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Amy, did you want to weigh in on the conservative versus the liberal gender ideology? I Because even that stat shows that women are trending more liberal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really obvious. I think I brought this up last time. Um, men don't have anything to relate to on the liberal slash progressive camp. They're literally like a bunch of they, them gremlins. Like what about a man's natural inclinations and biology would resonate with the messaging that's being purported on the left? And I'm not being, um, you know, I, I'm. 
I'm not saying that in a negative way. They call themselves that. They mm. call themselves gremlin, gremlin self, it itself. Like the lunacy that that uh, you know progressivism has ultimately landed at. I can see why no logical man would ever be able to yeah. resonate with that or even make an attempt to. Let me ask you ladies this question. Uh, I'm trying to think of extremes here. Mm. Just to okay, I got it. If you were gonna date or marry, mm -hmm. or even if one of your children turned out to be one of these two options, tell me what you'd be more comfortable with. Dating, marrying, or even having a child, and he turns out to be Andrew Tate. You're not a fan of Andrew Tate, I assume. You're not a fan of, okay. No. <laughs> or, here's the good news, you can be married slash the mother of Dylan Mulvaney. <laughs> so if you, can, if you can be married to Andrew Tate or Dylan Mulvaney, I mean, as alpha as a dude as it gets and as beta as a woman, man as it gets, what would you pick? Um, I know we fundamentally... Don't equivocate, just pick no, no, one. No, I know we fundamentally disagree on Andrew Tate, but seeing that I believe he is most likely guilty for the sex trafficking and for probably physically abusing his entourage of women. Plus, I don't personally believe in like polyamory and stuff like that. I would 100% um, rather have like a child who is trans and a child who has like physically most likely her other people <laughs> ah interesting and obviously the whole you know innocent till proven guilty thing but that's great yeah. that you called him guilty who would you rather marry um who would i i rather marry a trans person or a person who ends there up being we go trans guys than a she'd rather marry Peter. dylan mulvaney <laughs> than Ta who would you pick uh, I don't have any problem with trans people, so I wouldn't mind being with a trans person. I mean, what is I happening right huh? now, guys? Does that make you a Padrino, lesbian? Who would you pick? Who to marry? Andrew Tate or Dylan Mulvaney? A man, or at least one that thinks he's a man. No, <laughs> I mean, D Dylan is not a human to me. That's just, he's so confused. <laughs> I feel terrible if that you would want your child to be like that. Well, he is a human, just a confused human. <laughs> he's a confused But he's not even human. confused. He's it's the confused... people that agree with him that are confused. Who would he's you pick? He's confused. A man. Definitely a man, man. Okay. for sure. Amy? Tate, I'm curious. So let's yeah, hold say. On, hold on, you pick Tate? Yeah. Dave Rubin, in a hypothetical world. I would marry Andrew Tate. There it is. <laughs> Dave Rubin and Andrew Tate. <laughs> the internet, with, there's an OnlyFans for you. Why am I talking about politics? Guys, please subscribe so to the Dave Rubin, Andrew Tate, uh, Tate OnlyFans. Only subscribe to that. <laughs> what was your question for Pixie? I'm curious, Pixie. Sorry, a lot of your answer was on the basis of the fact that you believe that he's hurt people, right? Yes. What about just like the equivalent of a masculine man who purports more like conservative and masculine values and, you know, minus all of the alleged. Right sex trafficking stuff and everything else. Who would you choose in that instance between Dylan Mulvaney and a masculine, masculine conservative man? man? It depends. Does a masculine, con cause I personally do not want to be a stay at home wife. There's a lot of reasons I couldn't, it's, it would take way too long to explain mm -hmm. here. No, Dylan will be that. You go, you <laughs> work it girl. Yeah, but if he expected me to just stay at home, then mm -hmm. you know, I would still be Dylan. Um, if he was more like masculine traditional in the sense of just like, oh no, like, um, you know, like he just had more masculine tendencies or whatever, mm -hmm. then I would be maybe more open to him because I, I think I would find him a little bit more attractive than um, mm -hmm. Dylan. I, I think you could very easily make the other argument though that Dylan Mulvaney has done far more damage than, than Tate because Dylan Mulvaney has helped confuse a generation yes. of yeah. young boys into thinking that they're girls or young girls thinking into their boys. Yeah. And then you put them on drugs and you chop their genitals off. Mm -hmm. And then when they grow up about 10 years later and they're like, it was a 12 year old girl who probably was just gonna be a lesbian if anything. She yeah. liked sports more than Barbie and now her mm -hmm. breasts are chopped off or a boy who maybe was gonna probably be a gay guy who mm -hmm. now has, you know, generally, you know, like all of that stuff, I think is far worse, putting aside the specifics of the, the Tate thing. Yeah, yeah. well, I think well here, here's, my, here's my final thing and then we'll move on to the last topic. Uh, I asked you this for a reason. I had no clue what your answer was gonna be. But I, the whole conversation was how boys are becoming more conservative, mm -hmm. AKA just common sense at this point. Whereas women, respect to you guys, Bro, what are you talking about, Dylan Mulvaney? What? Are, I don't even know what that answer is. But the average boy out there, the average young man, will sit there and be like, "Okay, I have two options. I'm a dude. I'm just a regular boy. I'm 16. I'm 18. I'm 20. I've got two paths. I can go this path where I'm a badass dude being a kickboxer with hot chicks driving a Bugatti, or I can be a chick with a dick." An average dude is going to be like, sign me up for that Bugatti life, bro. So that's the disconnect that I wanted to discuss. Unbelievable that you're going with Mulvaney. Last topic, guys. 
something lighthearted, something that is unifying. Nobody ever gets uh -oh. into any conversations or any drama about this. And that, of course, is the lighthearted conversation regarding Israel versus Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the unifying conversation out there in the world. And I wanted to let Dave and the panel discuss this because you just came back from Israel. Israel. You saw what was going on there. And um, uh, the discussions are now that are now being had, uh, you know, Candace Owens, she's been involved. We talked about this on PBD Podcast. Check that out. She's kind of getting thrown into the mix. Tucker Carlson is going after Ben Shapiro. You have rabbis going after uh, hosts. There's, there's different conversations going on. At the end of the day, it's pretty, sim uh, pretty easy to me. A democracy defending itself versus a literal terrorist organization. It's pretty clear to me. But now you have people like Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders, Chuck Schumer, basically saying, Netanyahu, we got to get him out of there. We can't condone this. Um, there, there's just so much, I guess, moral equivalence to what's happening right now. So as someone who just came back from Israel, uh, how would you basically describe what's going on in the reality on the ground? Yeah. Well, I'd much rather talk about that than talk about the fight between, say, Candace and a rabbi. Um, look, there are 40 some odd Muslim uh, Arab countries out there with no plurality, no Christians left in their nation, no Jews left in their nations, no minorities, virtually no minority rights, no democratic rule, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's one tiny place the size of New Jersey in the Middle East uh, where Christians live and Jews live and Druze live and other minorities live and, live and Baha'i and atheists and all of that. Uh, and it's a democracy. It's an imperfect democracy, like all democracies are imperfect, all societies are imperfect. Um, but it shares it shares American values and rooted in individualism and Judeo-Christian values and all of those things. And they're fighting an organization that is quite literally genocidal in their intent and their actions. And they have every right to defend themselves. It's not even that you have a right. You have a duty to defend yourself. Uh, if 2,000 of your own people were killed and then several hundred are hostage, and we're talking about we're talking about literally from as young as one year old, mm -hmm. one of the hostages who's most likely dead now, to grandparents, some who survived the Holocaust to only be dragged into Hamas tunnels, you have a duty wow. as a society to save them. And I was there and I saw the 47-minute the video that they have not released fully to the public. Mm. But if you want to see a video of people literally getting beheaded with kitchen knives, I mean, wow. I saw it getting beheaded and then Hamas soldiers walking away with smiles on their mm -hmm. face. Calling, Some of this was from a body cam, I assume. This one, no, some of them were from their phones. Wow. And, of Hamas's and phones, Hamas's is my phones. Point. And yes. some of them, they, That's took, what I meant. they took the Israelis' phones so that they could live stream it on Facebook so yeah. their wow. families would see it. But literally watching people slice people's heads off and calmly walk away, frothing at the mouth, smiling, laughing. One Hamas guy calling his mother, Mom, I just killed 10 Jews wow. with my own bare hands. I have their blood on their hands. And the mother's screaming, uh, God is great. Allah uh, Yeah. Um, wow. And by the way, they never screamed uh, free Palestine in the video. Uh, they screamed Alu Akbar, right? God is great. They never screamed kill the Israelis. They mm. screamed kill the Jews. So they will mm. gladly kill Chuck Schumer. They will gladly kill Bernie Sanders and, and mm. anyone else. So I would say Israel has a right, a duty, and everything else. Uh, also, just a couple quick stats. There never was a country known as Palestine. It's never existed. Who was the prime minister? What was the money? Uh, the, the, when you, people talk about Palestine, they're talking about the British mandate of Palestine, which was part of the British Empire, mm -hmm. which before that was part of the Ottoman Empire. Turkish and Israel. the British and the Arabs used to to boycott Palestine because that's where the Jews lived. The Palestine Post, which is now the Jerusalem Post, was the newspaper for the Jews. The Palestinian soccer team in the 1930s was all Jews. You can find a lot of Friedmans on that team and, and uh, Schwartzes and guys. How'd like, that team do, by the, the way? They were pretty decent, really? actually. They were pretty <laughs> okay. decent, yeah. You try uh, to fill up a bunch of all Jewish bad. basketball yeah. team these days yeah, yeah, yeah. to go against the NBA All Stars. I don't Although think it's a good thing. Maybe Tel Aviv is pretty is solid. Okay. Um, but in any event, um, they have a responsibility and a duty, and no other country would put up with this, and no other country would allow one rocket to be shot into their territory. Right. If, uh, if, Detroit, if, say, Montreal shot one rocket into Detroit, we'd bomb Mexico. Mm. So they have every right and duty to do it. And by the way, even if you don't care about Israel and you don't care about Pal you know, Arabs or whatever, or the, the Arabs of Palestine, and you don't care about any, or Jews or any of this stuff, do you think that if Israel goes down and we have a second Holocaust and all of the people who are marching in London get what they want, do you think they're done? Do you think they will wrap it up or will have they just begun? And I think the answer to that is quite obvious. Yeah, they're trying to make the caliphate happen. Here's yeah. my question for the more the progressives. Uh, and believe me, I want to hear your thoughts on this. When you see the, 
you know, gays for Gaza, right? And it, you know, I went to Tel Aviv. You didn't I went go to, to Gaza. Beach there. You didn't go to Gaza. No, I didn't go there. And I can't tell you, it was actually shocking to me how gay Tel Aviv was. There were more gay flags than Israeli flags. It Not was like, anymore. It's a lot of Israeli flags. Okay, now, now it is. But this was this yeah. summer. This was, I was like, holy yeah. shit. They have different beach. But the point is, it's a democracy. There's going to be left opinions, right opinions, all sorts of opinions. Everything's accepted. There's two million uh, Arabs, Israeli, Arabs, Israeli Arabs. Arabs that live there. How many Jews or Israelis live in Gaza? Zero. How many live in Morocco, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Saudi, in any of these countries? You know, there was Iran, one Jew zero. left in Egypt. I met him in 1997. I'm pretty sure he's dead now. Really? But I went and everybody was like, you got to go see the one Jew. You want to see a, you a, gotta a, see the guy. a seriously neurotic, nervous Jew? Yes. Go meet the one guy in Egypt. He was, I could just see like a Woody Allen type yeah. Egyptian. <laughs> like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. 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 He's like, uh, my me. family built the fucking pyramids. Yeah, yeah. This is the thanks I get. Yeah. Uh, Bassem Youssef, uh, who I've got into it before. What a fucking tool. Oh, yeah. He won't even go to Egypt. Because the president will kill him. Yeah. But he's like, I don't want to go to Israel because I don't think they're going to be nice to me. Your country complete, will kill you, bro. Complete nonsense. <laughs> okay? The Muslim brother. There, there are Muslim Arabs <laughs> yeah. on the Israeli Supreme Court. Yeah. Miss Israel is a Muslim Arab. It's complete it, nonsense. It's failed yeah. to be. But from a progressive standpoint, where do you stand on this situation? Are you calling for the ceasefire? Or do you want to see, is it, is it the exact same thing? Are these freedom fighters... Where do you stand on this? So the way that I see it is that I think um, Israel has a right to want to stop Hamas, especially with the terroristic actions that they've taken. With that being said, I wish that they learned the lessons that the United States learned when it came to battling Al-Qaeda and ISIS, right? We battled Al-Qaeda. We basically bombed a bunch of places. Um, we didn't institute any order or structure or help people in those areas mm -hmm. basically live a more stable life. And what happened, there was a power vacuum left and then ISIS came. And then when we were battling ISIS, that's like defeating them, I did still ongoing, but the way that we were basically able to reduce it drastically is that we became a lot more precise. We decided to like focus on specifically the leaders, toppling down that structure, um, not just like necessarily a mass bombing campaign as l mm -hmm. at least to the level that we did with al-qaeda are, are so, you claiming that's what israel's doing um it seems like and i know it's a small area so i know it becomes more complicated but it seems like a lot of civilian infrastructure and people have been um basically killed in the process of trying to take down hamas so at least from what do you know I, that they, hamas puts their weapons in mosques and in t in schools uh, schools yes, and which, and nurseries and yes, hospitals which is why at least from what I've seen, a specialized task force in these areas would make more sense than just bombing it because then you're also, one, killing civilians. And then what happens? Those civilians, especially the children, they grow up and they don't know the complexities of everything that's happening. All they know is, hey, Israel bombed my school, they bombed my hospital, and they killed my mom and dad that were there at that time or my teacher or whatever family member. So then they grow up to be radicalized. If your sister was raped and your mom was beheaded mm. um, and you and they also had your other sister in a tunnel and that was a half mile from your house how, how tolerant would you be to the people that did that i just what i wouldn't want to kill innocent people in an effort to get revenge like i would not like even if i went through like all these like horrible things i would you know never they be drop, okay they drop leaflets before they bomb yeah they I, i'm not okay area. with they, with being like hey you know what you fucked up my family so in order to get revenge i'm okay if you kill this random innocent family i will know like that just purports a cycle of violence well, i don't want more vote, people they did vote to be Hamas harmed in. Yeah, like, what is it? Around 50% of the population of, like, Palestine slash Gaza are children. Like, they don't, they don't really have a say in what's going on. You're a, you're a child. So I think there are, like, levels of nuance in this that we haven't really completely explored because rightfully so, or understandably so, I should say, um, we're blinded by, like, this hatred of, like, oh, revenge. Mm -hmm. And that's, we have to be careful with that. That's what I want to say. Let me uh, uh, give you one point to consider uh and i'll i'll stand by this i'm getting hamas, too old for this shit <laughs> hamas terrorist organization israel right to defend itself right to exist that's number one number two feel horrible mm -hmm. for the babies and the children in gaza in palestine feel horrible they do nothing to deserve this but their parents voted for hamas or basically approved for hamas so they're uh, Hamas is basically the one terrorizing them. 
The third thing. You know that about 30,000... Sorry, that? just real quick. You know about 30,000 civilians entered Israel that day. So Hamas mm. sent in a couple thousand soldiers. Mm -hmm. So these are... It's it Also, when people think it's a terrorist act, it was an army. They had an army of about 100,000 soldiers. They sent in several thousand soldiers, but then about 30,000 regular Gazans, yeah. moms, dads, shop owners, they went in to loot and burn everything down and everything mm. else. So so in many ways, there are no innocent people there. You saw the... You, you saw, don't think children wow. are no, 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 innocent? No, 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 no. 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 The, the child, no the child that happens to live there, but the death of that child is blamed on Hamas, who uses those children as civilian shields. If Hamas mm -hmm. wanted to fight like men, fight like men. Yeah, but no, they surround themselves in kindergartens and in mosques and things of that, that nature. But by the way, the Israelis don't have to care about them. Oh, there's only one country in the world that is asked to care about the people that are trying to kill them, mm -hmm. and that's Israel. I'm sorry, that's but I think every single country. person should care about children overall. I don't think um, I'm going to stop caring no, I know, about so a child again, just because you live in a different country. If your country, sister got beheaded and your care. mom got raped, we'd see what yeah, your response would be. You know, if that be. happens, I still wouldn't want the death of an innocent child i still wouldn't want nobody that. wants the death of an innocent well you're child. saying that there's no responsibility or they shouldn't care about those children so yeah you're okay with the death of them because you shouldn't care about them how, and that's bad how do you define proportionate force right like like how do you actually um like address like there's really truth is the first casualty of war that's a, a saying that i heard very early on and i think from both sides they can both feel fully justified in what it is that they're doing but what is the true proportionate force like that's all i could you know really contribute to you this know we killed a lot of nazis in world war ii and then that stopped mm -hmm. nazism yeah we didn't yeah, go nazis not kids and civilians well and that's actually we not true have you heard you remember the bombing of yeah. dresden we've killed yeah i'm not, de I'm not defending that either yeah, i'm not yeah. defending yeah. that either though don't you agree yeah. that that the bombing of dresden was bad let me get your guys thoughts on <laughs> a couple of things world what should they do with all the kids that have been dying in in yemen what do you mean? We should try to help, like, give aid and help children what when they're suffering. What about all the kids in Syria? Yeah, absolutely. When what it about comes Sudan? to Sudan, yeah, I care about yeah, children. Of but why doesn't anybody talk about that? Since you care about the kids, because so much. right now the United States is arming and funding Israel, and I think that's why people have a better. I have, we have influence over that as American citizens. You I don't, don't have think any that we influence. were arming anybody in Syria. No, we Syria were, but that's not good. Yemen? I don't defend that either. Yeah. Okay, but why don't you see people? Uh, advocating and campaigning and rioting, you know, uh, gays for Yemen. I think 30,000 30, people dead will make people... What's that? Uh, 30,000 people dead. What about 300,000 people dead or 2 million people dead? I think if you're... Because that's the amount of people that have died, have died in, Yemen in Yemen of starvation or in Syria. and famine, right, yeah. What's that? So a lot of them are starvation and famine, others... I have guess the point that I'm making here is everyone wants to single out what's happening in Israel and Gaza. 30,000 in the greater context of things pales in comparison what's happened with literally million people in Yemen or in Syria. Horrible atrocities. Sudan, half the half, like countries in Africa, you hear nothing. You don't hear a peep, zero. You don't even know about the numbers. But when Israel wants to defend themselves after literally being attacked, all of a sudden they're the bad guys, they're the genocider guys. Pretty horrible at genocide because the population has basically increased. 5X. 5x in the last few years here's another question uh the rape the rape thing is weird to me especially as women forget about the jewish and the arabs and the muslims the rape why don't you hear stories about israeli idf members raping the women why do you only hear the rape on the there are there's lots really? lots of documented instances of the idf and uh other imprisoned Palestinian people being abused, sexually abused in prisons and jails in, in Israel. You hear that? Yeah. But you don't hear it currently. Like, by the way, that's in any jail in the realm of the world, by the way. The rape. Okay, drop the soap. There's the joke. I'm saying in the act of war, you don't hear, I hear zero of these stories come out well, all about this... them raping the women. But I hear tons of stories. So where, I hear believe all women. If uh, women's, where are you united on the, on the rape stuff? Well, I... You not feel bad for the rape? The rape yeah, of victims? Course they do. Of course. Yeah, of course. Rape is horrible. Like, okay. I, I think. Um, Except what for is when it? it happens to Israeli women, though. No, it, no. it's horrible for anybody who's a victim of it. Like, I think um, this goes back to your earlier question oh, why are people talking about this versus that? Well, yeah, a lot of it just comes down to, like, what's in the news. People will talk about what they see in the news more often. It's not necessarily a matter of, like, oh, I actually have less moral care or whatever. It's just the fact of the matter is when you see something talked about a lot, you end up talking about well, it. Well, here's yeah. my point. You talk about what's in the news. 
Why is it in the news so much? There's been a civil war in Yemen. Google how many people have died in Syria or Yemen. It's Arabs killing each other, Arabs and Muslims, babies dying, starvation. It's the worst thing in the world. Dave can tell you all about this. It's not even in the news. You don't even know about it. But God forbid Israel wants to defend their country from a terrorist organization calling for their death. It's all over the news. But that's my point, is it's an inconvenient truth that all these deaths, all these murders, Arabs killing other Arabs, Muslims killing other Arabs, you don't even know about it. But God forbid Israel defends itself. It's all over the news. It's That's my point, Pixie. Do you think that it's possible that Israel could have killed less than 30,000 people? Well, first off, you're taking Hamas's numbers. So you're taking a terrorist organization. You're talking numbers. about the Gaza that's Health Ministry? Yeah, yeah it's that's... Hamas run, but the Gaza Health Ministry is cited internally by the U.S. If you're about State to say Department. UN, I'm going to tell you right no, now. By the no. US they State... have zero by the... credibility the US State in the U.N. The U.S. Department internally cites the Gaza Health Ministry because their numbers have repeatedly been consistent okay, with what okay. other independent human rights orgs report as well as the U.N., sure. Yeah, so well, I'm going to ask you a question, since they, you're defending yeah. them so much. Yeah. If you had the I'm not opportunity... defending Hamas. No, no. Clearly, you're... If you, you could take think, a nice little vacation did, uh, to yeah. Gaza or Israel, where would you go? Uh, you don't even have to wear a headscarf. I don't want to really go to either of those places, really? to be honest. Yeah. Tell me why. Tell me why they're the same. Uh, Gaza right now is being uh, bombarded with bombs Prior and to the violent bombing. How about onslaught. That? Prior to October 7th, where oh, would you have I wouldn't have been allowed in because of the economic blockade that Israel and Egypt enforce. You wouldn't be allowed in where? Into Gaza because let's of the, say you, they said the they would have made an exception for because you. of the blockade enforced by Israel okay. and Egypt. Yeah. And why wouldn't you go to Israel? Uh, I'm not, I have no interest in going to Israel. Okay. So it's the same thing. I never said <laughs> it was the Gaza same. You asked me where Hamas. I'd rather go, and I say I don't have any interest in going to Gaza okay. or Israel. Dave, I, I mean, where do you want to go? Yeah, with this? yeah. she's whatever. But uh, hopefully, you'll be the the future of a progressive <laughs> movement because that that would be there's something you got some of the pieces. You'll be all right. <laughs> Laura, do you want to weigh in on this as someone that is not uh, Jewish or Muslim uh, oh, no. and has no uh, bone to pick with anyone here? Where would you stand on someone like this? I don't. No, I do think they have the right to defend themselves. And what I keep hearing you say, this is going to, it's not a tangent, but I'm definitely one that's like equal outrage, right? Why are you saying this about this, but you don't say it about the other thing? You talk so much about children and about poor children, and I would do anything for the children. I just don't know how you would feel about the um, the unborn. So you probably, as a progressive, you would feel, you know, abortion cool. Oh, this is a whole philosophical it, discussion. It is. Let's stay, it let's is, stay on this is, topic. Let's not get to abortion. I'm not, I'm not going okay. there. But the, what my point is, is the equal outrage. That's what I was going with. Is that, to me, I, I, I keep hearing that word children and the poor children and the innocent children. And all I keep thinking in my head is you probably don't care how many millions have been killed here in this country. Or let's just go right here and wow. talk about the children here that are getting killed by all the illegal immigrants that are coming in here and killing them. So again, about Israel, I absolutely think they need to defend themselves. There's still hostages there. They need to get, get them out. So that's how I feel about that. But again, I don't have like one side um, or the other, like like what we're talking here, and I'm not I'm not going to fight about it. Mm -hmm. But I just want equal outrage. Like, be upset about all the things, or shut up about all. Well, the things. here's what I'll say. Final word, and then we'll we'll wrap up. You know, there's the famous quote: "Show me your friends, I'll show you your future," mm -hmm. or "Show me your friends, I'll show you who you are." Just look at who's friends with each other. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Hamas. They got Hezbollah. Respect. <laughs> They got the Houthi rebels in Yemen. You're holding down the fort. They got ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram rooting for them. And their granddaddy, their poppy, their benefactor is Iran. Good luck, guys. Those are your friends. Hey, don't, That's forget, your crew. don't forget Ilhan and AOC. Don't and, forget uh, those people yeah, that's Bernie. going on there. But then you have, on Israel's side, you know, the country you live in, United States of America, kind of on that team. And then you have every liberal democracy around the world, anyone who stands for just basic Western values, Australia, Canada, the EU, South Korea, you name it, all of a sudden they're on Team Israel. Interesting. So if you guys are comfortable rooting for Hamas land on behalf of Iran, all good. It's all good. I'm just letting you know that the majority of Americans are not buying this shit. But you know who is? Gen Z. I don't know about Gen Z. But who's influencing tic, uh, Gen Z more than anybody? Shout out to TikTok. We'll see what's going on there. Anyway, The majority of they, Americans support a ceasefire. Overwhelmingly. 75% of Americans support a ceasefire. 90% of Democrats support a ceasefire. 51% of Republicans support a ceasefire. You know who also supports a ceasefire? 
Israel if they can get their hostages back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want They're the like, dude, we'll stop too. bombing you today. Just give us our back 150 hostages. What should they do with those hostages, by the way? Hamas should release all the hostages. They shouldn't be having and any if hostages. They don't, and if they don't, and if they don't, what should Israel do? Just sit there and wait, hope, hope and pray. You know what they the, should do? I'm going to answer it. If you care They're going to write hostages, an email. Dear Hamas, please, please. please return our hostages. Adam, if do you not, know? I'm going to send a mean tweet out to you. Adam, do you know when the most amount of hostages were released during the, all of this chaos? When there was a ceasefire. It was during a ceasefire. Correct. Yeah, that's why I support a ceasefire. I want the hostages released, and I want the onslaught to stop. I don't stop. think there's anybody that doesn't want to see a ceasefire in the bombings anymore. Mm -hmm. Return the rest of the hostages. I agree. That's what's happening right now. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, final word to Dave Rubin on this topic. Yeah, you're so confused about everything. It's, yeah. so, it's so bizarre, and it's weird. It's weird. I forget what that's like. Um, I've enjoyed this. This yes. was fun. Thank you, Dave Rubin. You're a fine host. Thank I you, sir. I love your name. You're good. Thank you. I like her. Anyway, You're guys, great. this is, uh, it's been a spirit. By the way, thank you guys for being here. The thank show you. would not be complete without a multitude mm -hmm. of different voices as we have here. And we'll let the audience decide who won, who they agree with, who they align with. That's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. The happy ending, that was sort of an unhappy ending. <laughs> but uh, go, let's go around the room here. Give us your final thoughts before we wrap up. Where can people find you? Go ahead. I just want to ask Dave if he's changed his mind on whether or not he'd debate Sam Cedar. Have you changed your mind? God, you're such a loser. Such <laughs> yeah. A loser. Okay, so you're still going to dodge Sam, Sam Cedar? Cedar is or she is or they're both are? No, they both are. But okay. Just, no, because yeah. I asked him on the Whatever podcast if he'd, if he'd debate Sam Cedar, and he said no, so I was just asking if he'd changed his mind on that. Yeah. But uh, my name's Aaron, a.k.a. Straighterade, and I'm at Straighterade on everything. You can find me online on X or Twitter. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, all social media. So thanks okay. for being a great host. I look host, forward Adam. to seeing all the footage from your trip to Gaza and see how that goes for you. Yeah, yeah. I'll look pay forward for to it. that. I'll, 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 pay for I'll it. double whatever he pays. Yeah. Make sure to wear a bikini. You guys okay. can make a yeah. group trip. Yes, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, Let's everyone. do it. Oh, well. Um, well, we'll go to Israel first, hmm. and then we'll go to Gaza. Yeah, we'll and get, we'll see which one you like better. We'll get falafel, and then we can head to Gaza. Yeah, we'll have falafel <laughs> and then a little bit of headaches. It'll just be like a little uh, drip, tzatziki. Um, Laura Padrino, Padrino's Cuban, my friend. Final thoughts on today's episode and then tell, where to tell people where to find you and tell the people to, where they can find the yeah, uh, vaca frita that's going on over there, Padrino's <laughs> Cuban. So today was great. Loved having you on, Dave. And, and all great discussion all around, all love, all respect. Everybody can have different opinions and we could all be play nice. Um, Padrino's Cuban is on Insta. We have... Um, five locations across South Florida. One is just down the street right here on US1. And to find me personally, it's laura.padrino on Instagram. And I'm on Manect as well if you want to check me out, ask me questions. And yeah. There great, you go. Great job. On Manect. On Manect. There Connect with me on Manect. Pixie, my dear friend, you're a sweetheart. Uh, <laughs> final thoughts. Let the people know where to find you. Hi, I'm Pixie. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Pixie. I know I've been here for two hours. Hi, guys. Um, you can follow me on P X I E L O V E, it's Pixie Love, um, on Instagram, um, on Twitter, on all the social media platforms. Thank you guys so much for having me here. It's always a pleasure. I love discussing all these different opinions, and I had a great time. As Thank I always you. said, despite being a super progressive, one of the sweetest, goofiest, cutest girls you ever find. <laughs> Pixie there brings telly, Teletubby energy yes, to like every she set does. that she, she comes does. on. Set. And respect you, Aaron, for being here. Thank you might you. not agree with anything you have to say, <laughs> but I respect your right to say it. Thank Unlike you. Unlike other places where they'll behead you. Amy, <laughs> uh, go ahead. What you, would your final thoughts be? Uh, incredible show. Very much enjoyed uh, hearing from you in person. Obviously, I've watched your content, so it was great to be in a conversation with you. Uh, for everybody on the panel, um, great convos. Uh, I'm actually dropping my first YouTube video in three months uh, next week. It's going to be all about the cashless society that's currently taking place in Australia, all of the diabolical policies that they're implementing behind the scenes. Um, so you guys can find me, Amy Dangerfield, on every platform and keep an eye out for that YouTube video. There she is. Natalia, before we get have our... Uh Special guest, wrap us up. What yes. do you want us to, people to know, Nat? By the way, you crushed your answer today. Thank you. Thank you. You, know? yes. you were sort of silent. And, yeah, you know? just observing. I, you know, first thing, you know, thank you all for attending. I think it's these conversations that allow the audience to really get their brain thinking because sometimes they don't get to have these conversations. So appreciate all of you guys for coming today. Um, make sure you guys comment, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. The channel is growing. We've got some big guests planned. Thank you for also coming, Dave. You know, I know you had PBD podcast, and then now you made your way down to Saucecast for My the first pleasure. time. So definitely going to bring you back. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Sauce, you know, to even watch you kind of be able to 
to uh, control these type of conversation and really give all the candidates on here to speak. So appreciate mm -hmm. you for even guiding that conversation. Well, thank you. And thank and, the, yeah. the ladies for being here. But yeah. shout out to, to the great Dave, Dave Rubin, Rubin for being here. Yes. Dave, I know your dream life is sitting around arguing with a bunch of women. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is what I you don't do for, this bro. Enough. I don't do this enough. I know you don't do this enough. Welcome to my world, bro. Yeah. It's not that easy. Yeah. But thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you've done this before a billion times. There's a camera. Let the people know uh, what you're working on, where to find you, your final message. Dave Rubin. Well, my final message is this. Since you should not just wait for someone to do it, you should build good things. And that's exactly what I did by starting Locals.com. So you can join us at, local, at RubinReport.Locals.com or you can join the Locals community overall because uh, the government's not going to solve your problems. You can solve your problems. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. I love that. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I say this every time to Dave. I love his mantra, his slogan. It's a crazy world and there's sane views. The world's as crazy as... It's probably ever been since our lifetime. Yeah. So let's bring some sanity into this equation. Oh, I almost forgot Humberto. Humberto. Our extremists over there. What yeah, do you have I to love say? the show. I have nothing to say. Israel is not an island. There's countries surrounding it, most of them Arab. Uh, moving children out of harm's way is a really good measure, you know. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Love Dave Rubin. I'm here because of him. Started on TYT, and I'm wow. leaning more towards this way. You know, the right Wait, way. Wait, you worked things. at TYT? No, no, no. I, oh, I started watching. watching oh, TYT. Wow. Yeah. Those were my thoughts. Oh, so, good for you. ladies, mm -hmm. you can, you can, you can make something out of yourself and start thinking right. But in his defense, <laughs> he was a single man, yeah. and now he's a married man. Wow. Yeah. Look at so this, this is what happens. Cheat the whole game. Wow. Yeah. You know, I was married briefly at one point. That's probably why I'm like, you and know, I don't, I'm single now. I don't know which way I'm going. But anyway, <laughs> fully advocate that the ladies have kids. Be a good mother. Fully advocate that you men out there, take your time, mm. bro. Make mm. your money. Create your, uh, your, your path in this world. Create some status. Look your best. Act your best. Feel your best. And then start banging out some kids. That's what? my plan. I'm gonna. I'm on the Dave Rubin trajectory. There you go. So there we go. But thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for being here. We're gonna be back next Thursday. Yep. With another full panel, mm -hmm. special guests as well. We'll make the announcement next week. Yes. But we'll see you guys. Thank you guys for all being here. Another episode of the Southcast. It's the Southcast, baby.